Good morning, everyone. I can see that more people are arriving in the waiting room, so I think we will get underway, but um, obviously some people are just joining a tiny bit late, but thank you so much for joining us at this relatively early hour and for some people, for some of our colleagues, it's an even earlier hour uh, because we are a, a global panel today. Um, so I'm delighted to be part of this panel on identity and anonymity, which marks the start of the second day of the annual conference of the Information Law and Policy Centre. And the first event was yesterday in London. Unfortunately, I myself couldn't make it, but I hear that it went very well and there were some great discussions um, and presumably ways to catch up afterwards with those. But today we're online, which means it can be a more international affair, which is quite exciting. Um, just to briefly introduce myself, I'm Judith Townend. I'm Senior Lecturer in Media and Information Law at the University of Sussex. And in a former life, or maybe identity, I was actually Director of the Information Law and Policy Centre when I'm still a Research Fellow affiliated with the centre, so I'm really pleased to be part of this today. Um, so our panel promises to be a really wonderfully diverse, stimulating set of papers and really truly interdisciplinary as well. Um, and this theme around anonymity and identity is something the ILPC has been interested in since its inception. Um, lots of events relating to that theme on erasure rights, for example, and we actually launched Professor Eric Berent's book a few years ago around um, anonymous speech and we had a really good discussion on that. And I thought it also seems a particularly appropriate topic as we watch, uh, perhaps with a little horror, what's happening at Twitter at the moment. Um, and thinking about our identities in that space for a lot of us as academics um, and you know policy and people in the policy field we've carved out crucial sort of professional personal identities at Twitter and I, th I think what's happening is maybe a reminder of how transient that can be and as some of us start to dip our toes into other social media platforms. So I'm really fascinated to see where we go with this morning's discussions but my main task of having said this preliminary bit is really just to be the timekeeper um, and I want very strict instructions to keep everyone to time. So uh, my colleague, Dr. Jeff Oslos, a senior researcher at the Institute for Information Law at University of Amsterdam and a leading expert on this topic is going to have the harder task of responding to the papers uh, in a very <laughs> concise way. Um, so what I plan to do is just briefly introduce each speaker um, with just a sort of line of bio and we can, I can put the fuller details into the chat. Um, and then we have 10 minutes for each paper and I'm going to give a two minute warning at eight minutes. Um, and assuming I managed to do that competently and don't get distracted and too engrossed in the papers, um, we can then take go to, to Jeff's responses and then we can take, pick up some of the audience questions as well. And um, to make that efficient, if you could paste your questions into the chat during this session, assuming that that functionality is working, then we can just pick up those. And if we don't have time, then I would just encourage you to you know, contact the speakers after the event. I think they can all be found online with their stated identities. Um, so that should be possible to have a kind of post-conference discussion if we don't have a full time here. OK, so that's enough from me. Um, the, our first paper is going to be presented by Camilla Wells and Kate Morrison. And just to briefly introduce them, Camilla is ethical automation specialist at the Australian Public Service and self-described as a mathematician come ethical developer. And Kate Morrison is a government lawyer at Queensland Public Service and a sessional academic at Queensland University. And their paper, as you can see, is titled Enacting the Right to an Exception, Developing what they call VAL. OK, so I'll hand over to you and then um, give you a warning at eight minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, yes. Before we begin on this, we need to first acknowledge the uh, First Nations people as the traditional owners of from the land where we speak, uh, Mianjin. We recognise the country north and south of the Brisbane River, home to the Tordorul and Yagara nations. We pay respects to their elders, past, present and future. Tonight, um, I'm Camilla. And I'm Kate. And we'll be talking to you about, as said, enacting the right to be an exception through the program VAL. So to begin with, um, we're using a broader definition of recommender system. Whether it's an actuarial calculation tool, a digitized survey, or artificial intelligence, or machine learning model, a recommender system is one that provides a recommendation for the decision at hand. Currently in Australia, there's a Royal Commission into what was called RoboDebt, an automated debt raising system for the welfare system, which erroneously used earning averages to ground debt notices. The result was an overwhelming number of people who were dependent on the welfare system having payments frozen or reduced to cover this debt. 
a number of welfare recipients actually committed suicide and many others considered it as there was no way they would be able to pay back this money that was said to be owed. The biggest issue with robo debt, well, while in this instance, the policy behind the programming appears to have been flawed, more significantly, there was no consideration of a person's circumstances, nor an ability for human inter intervention to appropriately deal with the fallout that was then created by the system. So how could such a system be influenced by the identity of people for whom its impact could be disastrous when there's no consideration of the individual being affected? Justice systems around the world have developed with the underpinning of natural justice and procedural fairness. The English justice system, much of which Australia inherited at colonisation, has two limbs of natural justice, the rule against bias and the right to a fair hearing. Further, in the majority of legal systems, a demonstrated lack of procedural fairness is a ground of appeal. Significantly in the criminal justice space, what is being considered when choosing to remand a person to custody is effectively an extreme limitation of that person's human rights. While limitation of human rights is to be expected when someone is imprisoned for committing a serious crime, it cannot be avoided that such limitation be done only when necessary to keep a community safe or as appropriate punishment under legislation. To be able to properly implement recommended systems within the justice framework, these principles cannot be ignored. It's our view that who you are should matter as much as what you did. While every one of us contributes to statistics of gender, race, nationality, level of education, employment status, marital status, carer status, religion, just to name a few, it's imperative that bias against any of these factors ought to be removed and mitigating factors for criminal proceedings, such as bail and sentencing, not be ignored. Who you are matters. In the last few years, social justice bodies are demanding improvements, namely quality assurance. For example, employing a pretrial assessment tool requires ongoing quality assurance and periodic validation from the Pretrial Justice Institute in 2019. In the medical context, initially the FDA regulation framework for software as a medical device, like another form of recommended system, demanded a monitoring feedback loop to complete the quality assurance requirements. They have since softened their stance. So some AI, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning researchers have suggested a holistic approach to such systems. And with the iterative buildup of input used in recommended systems, it is the logical progression for software quality assurance to close that feedback loop. Unfortunately, as far as I can see, it appears to be only really an academic consideration. And worse, it often focuses on the software developer as the end user of the actual output. If you do know of any other research that contradicts this, please let us know, I've been searching for it. In the social decision-making context, just like as in the medical context, the doctor or the judicial officer is the person who needs to be the one who validates the outcome. Building code in isolation is a wasteful task. And as a disciplinary duo, we joined forces to create, or sorry, design and create VAL. In line, sorry, in line with good quality assurance practices, we began with a process definition and solution design document. All good software developers know that they must follow the maxim document everything. Kate collected the relevant direct and indirect acts, legislation such as the Bail Act or you know, the right to maintain lawful gainful employment. And uh, while we use parallels for our local Queensland law, it, it was built on a hypothetical jurisdiction. And through several consultation sessions um, and co-design sessions, uh, we carefully confirmed that the fundamental thresholds for that decision logic were accurately representing precedents. I translated that into deterministic logical expressions, which I could then actually code into VAL. With all this being outlined in the documentation, the design could be approved, you know, beyond the hypothetical by the judicial process owner for the jurisdiction. And in line with good quality assurance, designs must be approved before they go into any kind of production. So this part of the project actually was highly resource demanding. Co-design though, it's absolutely necessary and essential. VAL could not succeed if the logical expressions were not actually correctly mapped. VAL itself is technology agnostic. It's essentially a deterministic logical set of expressions that can be written in any coding language. It's the compilation of the context, specific policies, acts, precedents, and such that vary from one jurisdiction to another. So VAL, when it's built, must be relevant to the implementation of whichever recommended system it is there for. It's more of a methodology. 
it's not one size fits all and it's definitely not a miracle cure. So consider the following. As a judicial officer yourself, you are presented with a charge for consideration and you're given the corresponding recommended risk rating for the defendant because the recommended system has been implemented in your jurisdiction. So do you release or remand this person? With VAL, you get a better picture. Depending on the availability and legality of information sharing and whatnot, VAL will compile tags that succinctly describes the defendant within the context of those thresholds. So now, marked as an exception to the system, do you release or remand this defendant? We tested all the logical variations to ensure that there were no technical errors. The real testing here was the case studies. So we complied, compiled another number of cases from recent incidents and two were presented here. The first is a charge of a breach of temporary protection order, which is a domestic violence order put in place on an interim basis and is usually in place until a final order is made. And this was the case of Rowan Baxter um, days before he horrifically murdered his wife and children. So you can see that the recommender said, no, it was fine. We're confident to have him released on bail. So it was a false negative. The second case here in the third table is that of Rebecca Ma, an Indigenous Australian who died in custody. But the question here is, should, you, should she have been in custody at all? There are flaws here and there are huge complexities that have been glossed over. There are oversimplified presumptions made, but this is intended to be provocative. If your jurisdiction has implement, implemented a recommender system, there must be a complete quality assurance of that recommender system and you can close that feedback loop with VAL. The implementation of VAL alongside the recommender system like Compass or Heart in the UK, it provides real time support for the release remand decision or whichever context, it can be rewritten for other contexts. Rather than just reviewing the reductionistic recommendation, the judicial officer is supported with salient details of the charge at hand in line with the jurisdiction's own policies. So it rehumanizes the subject of that social decision-making, the release remand decision. You've got two minutes left. Excellent. So there's no time to go into any additional benefits today. So please reach out if you'd like to know more on that. I'll skip ahead. So as Chief Justice Krakus of the South Australian High Court said when writing about the artificial intelligence and judicial considerations, the intersection of artificial intelligence and other new technologies with the judicial role, the name of his paper, Deciding when future opportunities for transformation and redemption of a person should prevail over his or her past failures involves what is essentially a human question. So how do we replicate that human question? Every jurisdiction that makes use of a recommender system must validate the outputs enacting the right to be an exception. Every recommender system needs VAL. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. That was impressive uh, timekeeping. Thank you. That was um, so interesting. I've got so many questions, but it was brilliant that you gave us those practical examples as well. And um, yeah, I hope we, we get time to pick up on it in the Q&A afterwards. But without further ado, we do have to move on to our next paper at this point. Um, so we're now going to hear from Camerol Foisel, who's a doctoral researcher at, in the Faculty of Law at University of Helsinki. Um, and he's going to be speaking about the public interest doctrine in deciding the right uh, to be forgotten in spent criminal convictions. And I have to say, I've got a, a particular interest in this paper as it's very relevant to some, some work that I've been doing, um, but I will try and resist hijacking the Q&A later. Um, so I'll hand over to you, Camera. It looks like you've got your slides up. Okay, thank you so much. Can you please confirm once again, you can hear me. Yeah. Okay, so thank you so much for giving the floor today and uh, uh, welcome everyone from Helsinki. So as you can see, like this is uh, the part from my PhD project. And uh, in this paper, I'm trying to address uh, right to be forgotten in the context of spent criminal convictions. Well, and the term right to be forgotten, forgetting and remembering, it's uh, definitely a simple mechanism of the brain. No one can force anyone to remember something or forget something. So. Uh, right to be forgotten must be understood as uh, a passive force that is implied on the information available on the internet just to make it uh, less available 
are uh, a little bit uh, restricted from public access. And uh, the term spent criminal conviction must be understood as uh, I'm targeting those people who are, or whose sentence has already been carried out or who have been pardoned already by the competent authorities or whose uh, information related to an ongoing criminal procedure from the code has been leaked, outlined um, um, by the European Code of uh, Human Rights. Uh, so this kind of data that they might have a right to be forgotten. And uh, moving forward, the, starting from the problem is that in the European Union, as we know, many people are living with their past criminal conviction data and what uh, they want is they want to hide them to avoid related harm that might be caused by revealing those information. So the harms looks like more or less like this is open for open open source intelligence and it can be open for discrimination related to having insurance uh, related to home cars and others. And it also can be a public shaming matter. So it's really uh, and highly important at this time to uh, research this topic as I also consider it is um, a very hot topic to research with. So again, coming back to the right to be forgotten, we must understand that this is a non-exclusive right. This is not exclusive. So what does that mean? That means like there are certain grounds that must be applied to restrict the application of this right. So what I'm working with is a public interest uh, restriction or derogations of this right to be forgotten. And the fact behind that is that uh, we have uh, a journalistic exemption that provides the news companies and the uh, online news portals to publish uh, news that is of public interest now online. So uh, though this is also true, this kind of data or information related to criminal offense and convictions are already protected by the European laws. Article 10 of the General Data Protection Regulation Despite there are certain exceptions that we must consider and public interest is one of them and journalist and journalistic activities uh, put public interest in front to publish that kind of news. So it is very important for us and the uh, aim of this paper to outline a boundary of the protection in a way that helps the controllers who process this kind of data to understand how they should actually apply it. And moving forward to realize my aim, I have a research question that I'm trying to address uh, in this paper. And, and that is how should the controllers apply the public interest doctrine in providing a right to be forgotten in the context of these spent criminal convictions. And uh, stating the possible outcomes, I have already found like uh, there might be a direction and I might argue that there is possible that a systematic right to be forgotten might be needed on behalf of the controllers that they enforce it on, in an online context. Uh, and uh, there are some sources stated in there where I, um, they introduce this concept uh, in some way. For example, uh, Lindsay in, in, in his um, uh, in a book um, introduced this as a formal uh, removal mechanism. So I will try to have a substantiated view of that in, in this upcoming paper. And moving forward, here comes the balancing again like uh, whenever the controllers and anybody else who is trying to approve or determine or uh, allow or disallow, the right to be forgotten or a right, uh, balancing comes in front for every time. In terms of public interest, that current research shows like we have two most important, um, now broadly speaking, two most important uh, principles that allows publication of that kind of data under journalistic exceptions and that that are how much time that has been passed of publication that that uh, I rephrase that as passage of time and the second is like whether to determine whether the person is a public figure or a private figure so it's easy to understand that if uh, what does it mean by public figure well uh, essentially any act or any person that um, uh, in, incites public um, to be in their eyes uh, so there is, uh, it's easy to understand what does it mean by public figure. So what it refers to is essentially when a person becomes a private figure from public figure, that transition is possible, then uh, the right or privacy rights tends to have some weight on the other side. But passage of time that I had this impression that has a, it's a very umbrella term. So I had this inquisition in my mind that what does it mean by passage of time and what actually happens with passage of time? 
And I came to know what happens with passage of time. The three things happen. First, publicity interests uh, shifts towards the privacy interests. And uh, you can see in the figure that from, uh, it's a metaphoric time, from time one to time two, it was, there was a publicity interest. Uh, for example, let's think about uh, substantial in interest or general interest that public has general interest in some kind of activity. For example, prime minister of Finland or prime minister in the United States or the United Kingdom. And uh, in terms of the privacy interest that they didn't have, people don't care probably what I am doing here or what I will be doing if we are doing the same act. And the second thing is that public figures may transform into private figures. In this thing, we I try to argue that uh, with the passage of time, absolute pu public figures might transform into private figures. And uh, there might be another transition that uh, they might be relative, uh, relative, relative uh, public figures. So my argument is that when they are absolute uh, public figures, the entitlement of this right to be forgotten might be the least. In the relative or in the middle ground, they can be moderate, whether this is hard to say, but at the same time, we have to make a decision. So uh, it refers to moderate. And if the, the person becomes completely a private figure after, let's say, the passage of 10 years or 15 years, then the entitlement of right to be forgotten can be the most, arguably, because the, the public or the common public might not have that much interest in knowing about what the person is doing or what the, the person uh, has done in their past. And the third thing, it uh, brings to us to this uh, figure. And my argument is like, with the passage of time, processing may become lawful and unlawful depending on the achievement of purpose. So the achievement of purpose must be understood as uh, of whether the purpose is achieved according to one of the data processing principles. If the purpose is completely achieved, then it is not right to process the data further. For example, if journalism activities, uh, the purpose of journalism activities is achieved, then there is no reason to process it further unnecessarily, or maybe there is no imminent need of that. So achievement of purpose is very important for us to understand at this point, because like if well, I, what I'm trying to argue is if the purpose is achieved, then there is no, um, uh, the purpose is achieved, then the processing possibility is uh, very slim. If the purpose is not achieved, then processing might be allowed. So looking at the figure, I tried to- You just got two minutes left. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I tried to uh, categorize uh, the processing as gain and uh, loss of the privacy. You can see in the, uh, 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 middle point, which is uh, um, which is depicted by a violet line, it, 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 it's a standard of loss and gain. So at a particular time, we have to see what kind of purposes we are trying to achieve. So there are certain type of crimes and related to the data uh, where loss to privacy becomes higher, and gain to processing becomes higher. Again, if you can, if you see on the uh, blue line, then you can see like uh, the uh, process private loss loss to privacy is always higher than uh, standard uh, in in the standard of loss and gain. And again, if you see the lighter green line here, you can see the processing gain is always higher than uh, comparing to the standard of the loss and gain. For example, if a politician wants to be a politician and decides to be in the public life for the rest of the of his life and is involved in a sexual assault type of activities, then public has always the right to know about the activities. And again, if a minor has uh, has committed some kind of overspeeding or uh, something related to that uh, related to that kind of offense in the moment of madness or bouts of mistake, then the privacy loss might be always higher. So given the fact, I, at this point, need to help to understand, and uh, this kind of is actually my point of discussion, that is it feasible to argue that uh, we actually have, or we actually can provide a systematic delisting or right to be forgotten, enforceable by the controllers. And I also want to uh, ask that if systematic delisting or right to be forgotten uh, is possible, then can we also call it as a systematic delisting uh, uh, we can also call the systematic delisting of um, as a delisting or right to be forgotten by default. Can we use terms to refer the systematic 
delisting or writing forgotten. And thank you so much. That was the end of my presentation. Thank you. Again, very punctual. Thank you so much. I mean, so much in there to pick up. And thank you for highlighting these ambiguities and sharing your analysis with us. And I hope um, yeah, I, can, I can follow up with you afterwards, if not in the session today. But um, yeah, we are moving on to our next speaker now. Irene, we can't really see your face at the moment, so you might need to pull your screen down a little bit. Um, yes, yeah, so this is our next speaker, uh, Dr. Irene Katsaria, who's reader in international media law at the Department of Journalism Studies at the University of Sheffield in the UK. And she's going to be speaking to us today about recent ECHR and German case law on the right to be forgotten. So feeds on very nicely from our previous paper, um, from search engines to online archives. So I hope you've got the facility to share your screen. Um, if you've got slides or are you? Oh, we cut, you're muted at the moment. Okay, excellent. Great. I hope everyone's found I've been putting the bio details into the chat um, since my introductions are so brief. Yeah. Irene, oh, over to you. Yeah. And okay. I will give you a minute warning. Yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. So uh, I will talk about uh, recent case law by the European Court of Human Rights and by uh, the German um, Constitutional Court on the right to be forgotten. Uh, And um, my emphasis will be on how uh, this right has moved from search engines to uh, online news archives. Uh, so one important reason for uh, the right to be forgotten as it was conceived uh, in the Google Spain case was that search uh, engine uh, allow the creation of a, a complete profile of a data subject. Uh, but this um, ability is uh, uh, missing in the case of uh, press archives. Uh, we will discuss, uh, uh, first of all, a case decided by the European Court of Human Rights, the case uh, Hurben versus Belgium. Uh, this case concerns the complaint by the editor of the Le Soir newspaper uh, against an order to um, anonymize uh, an article from uh, 1994 uh, that concerned a fatal car accident uh, and mentioned the name of the driver who was responsible uh, for the accident. Uh, the driver had been convicted and was rehabilitated in 2006, and he claimed that uh, the easy retrieval of uh, this information about his involvement in the accident would um, impair his reputation as a doctor. Uh, the um, sorry, uh, the European Court of Human Rights uh, found that there was no violation of Article 10 uh, ECHR as a result of the anonymization order. Uh, it held that the naming of the driver more than 20 years after the tragic events had no news value, uh, and uh, that uh, the uh, anonymization order was necessary, otherwise there would be indefinite and grave harm to the reputation. Uh, of the doctor. Uh, now, this case is pending before the Grand Chamber, so it remains to be seen whether this uh, um, outcome will be reversed. The second case by the European Court of Human Rights is the case of uh, Biancardi versus Italy, uh, and this concerned uh, the publication by a small uh, local uh, news website of an article about a stabbing between two brothers in a restaurant in Italy. In 2010, uh, the one of the brothers asked the applicant to uh, remove the article from the internet and lodge court proceedings. In 2011, the applicant de-indexed the article. However, in 2016, the Italian Supreme Court held that the easy accessibility of the article until 2011 breached uh, the um, applicant's, uh, sorry, the um, one of the brothers' reputation. Um, the European Court of Human Rights uh, held that uh, the order finding the editor liable for failing to the index did not reach Article 10 uh, ECHR uh, because the applicant had failed to de-index in a timely manner, despite the fact that actually criminal court proceedings were uh, still pending by the time of the Italian Supreme Court's judgment. 
uh, the European Court of Human Rights emphasized that the right to freedom of expression decreased over time compared to uh, the right to reputation, and that the data in question were particularly sensitive because they pertain to criminal proceedings. Uh, we uh, will now move to discuss two judgments uh, by um, the German Constitutional Court, but uh, before doing so, it's worth mentioning that uh, the German Federal Court has been traditionally very reluctant to grant requests to remove or anonymize uh, identifying information in online press archives. Uh, and one um, uh, well-known case in which this happened was the Apollonia case, which concerned uh, the high-profile murder of two people uh, on a yacht on a uh, high sea. In uh, the case of Right to be Forgotten One, the German Constitutional Court reversed the federal court's decision in Apollonia. Uh, it uh, held that the um, uh, unrestricted uh, availability of identifying uh, information in the archive of the Spiegel magazine more than 40 years uh, after the murders um, uh, was likely to impair uh, the, the murder's uh, reputation. Um, it uh, considered that um, the federal court had not paid sufficient uh, attention to the impact of the continued dissemination on the complainant's uh, reintegration especially in light of his unobtrusive conduct since his release from prison. And uh, the general constitutional court also said that there is a need to identify effective technical measures uh, that would allow the suppression of the identifying information. Uh, and this could be by way of de-indexing, which pre pre prevents the search engine from picking up uh, the press articles or perhaps by referring the crawler to a duplicate anonymized version uh, of uh, the articles. On the same day as the right to be forgotten one case, the German Constitutional Court uh, were also decided in a second case, the case right to be uh, forgotten two. Um, and this case uh, concerned the segment uh, of the TV show Panorama uh, which was broadcast by NDR uh, and uh, in which uh, an interview featured with a complainant. And uh, after the end of the interview, uh, allegations were made that the complainant had unfairly treated an employee who had decided to join a work council. The German Constitutional Court in this case had that the uh, lower court, the higher regional court, had struck a satisfactory balance between the fundamental rights at stake, um, that it was uh, actually uh, right uh, not to uh, de-link uh, the said broadcast and that the right to personality enjoyed no precedence uh, in this case, um, not least because uh, not enough time had passed since the time of the uh, broadcast. Uh, however, the German Constitutional Court also stressed that the lawfulness of online publication cannot be assessed once and for all, but needs to take account of the realities of internet dissemination. Oh. Apologies. Uh, so in, uh, yeah, in conclusion, um, the recent case law of the European Court of Human Rights uh, shows a tendency to protect reputation of private individ individuals more um, than a freedom of expression or the right to uh, information. Uh, the German Constitutional Court on its part places these rights on an equal footing, however, is still prepared to undermine the integrity of press archives. Um, so it is problematic that uh, right to be forgotten style obligations have been increasingly extended to online press archives, despite the fact that these archives do not um, have the same capacity to profile data subjects as uh, search engines. And this leaves publishers with an impossibly, uh, impossible dilemma, either to 
um, sever the links with search engines or to compromise the integrity of their press archives. Uh, thank you for your attention and I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you so much. And I didn't even need to do my prompt, you were <laughs> right on time. Um, and so, yeah, wonderful, uh, re really useful analysis. Thank you and for introducing us to that German case law and the perspective there, which I really think will help us uh, develop our understanding and, and, and discussions in, the, in that regard, and especially thinking about it in relation to the, the paper we heard before yours. Okay, let's um, move on to our next um, and penultimate paper, which is going to be presented by Dr. Diego Machado. Um, who is Assistant Professor of Private Law at the Federal University of Vicosa. Um, and I believe the paper was also written with Dr. Danilo Deneda, uh, Professor of Law at IDP Law School, um, but he is not here today. Um, and the paper is on the right to online anonymity, a Brazilian perspective. And hopefully you can share your screen and that's all going to work well. Um. So, um, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor Judith, for the introduction. Um, I think I'm, uh, today I'm the only one uh, to go slideless. Um, and unfortunately, my co author, uh, Professor Daniel Doneda, couldn't join us today. But, well, um, I also would like to, to thank ILPC for putting this event and this panel together. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, um, so in this short presentation about uh, this paper, The Rights to Online Anonymity, a Brazilian Perspective, that I co-authored with uh, Daniel Doneda, I'll try to touch upon um, the key points and arguments that we developed for making the case for the legal protection of anonymity um, on the internet under the Brazilian legal system. For that purpose, I'm going to organize my talking um, five sections. Um, First, a few introductory remarks. Second, what do we mean by online anonymity? Third, a few words uh, on the existing models of protection of anonymity on the internet. Fourth, what a framework under the umbrella of the rights to privacy would look like. And lastly, how this framework fit into the Brazilian law. Um, anonymity uh, on the internet is a rather a disputed topic. From a legal point of view, um, we can find uh, diametrically opposed opinions. On one hand, are those who defend a, a strong protection to online anonymity. But on the other hand, though, um, there are uh, claims for its outright ban since it puts at risk the security of the internet environment by eroding law enforcement's capabilities of holding people accountable uh, for their illegal behavior. Well, um, in Brazil, this controversy has an additional element, according to the Article 5, 4 of the 1988 Federal Constitution, anonymous speech is prohibited. There is a, a centuries old um, tradition of outlawing um, anonymous speech in Brazil that dates back to the colonial era. Um, well, uh, in the digital age, there has been some debate with regards to the interpretation of this constitutional provision in the context of the current technological uh, paradigm shift. Um, well, uh, so first thing first, what is actually online anonymity and what do we mean? What do we mean by it? Uh, traditionally, the notion is correlated uh, to the absence of knowledge about someone's name or identity in a communication process. In this sense, we can tie anonymity uh, to one's choice to not disclose his or her name in communications uh, through internet applications. However, uh, from a more technical uh, perspective, online anonymity uh, must follow two preconditions. First, that an uh, anonymous action is not linkable to the identity of the actor. And second, that two or more anonymous uh, actions performed by the same actor are not linkable to each other, which means that untraceability is an additional layer on top of not having information of one of, of an actor's um, name or identity. Um, following this line of thought, we use Michael Frumkin's distinction between traceable and untraceable anonymity. To give a simple example, if an individual posts something on a social media platform without identifying himself with his real name or pseudonym even, it is possible to track him down using records of internet service providers logs like IP address, date and time span of the connection, and other subscriber information traceable anonymity. Uh, but if this individual has properly used some sort of anonymity network, such as Tor, 
it will be much harder uh, to trace him back and link his last actions to previous ones um, and traceable anonymity. Now, um, online anonymity is valued differently across jurisdictions. In a 2014 research paper, Giorgio Resta uh, defended that there are two models of protection of anonymity. The first model is underpinned in the protection of freedom of expression, which means that anonymity uh, is taken as an instrument of free speech, a shield from the tyranny of the majority, just to, to quote a well-known passage from the 1995 uh, US Supreme Court President McIntyre versus Ohio Elections Commission. This model is he heavily influenced by the US legal culture, but there are also decisions have say um, of other constitutional courts in a similar direction, as we see um, the Constitutional Court of Korea, the Supreme Court of Israel. The author uh, frames the second model as a manifestation of the right to the protection of personal data. Namely, quote, the model uh, of the control over the circulation of personal data, quote. Um, we take this model, however, as a form of regulation of personal data flows or data life cycles that is embodied through legal mandates like uh, confidentiality duties for internet intermediaries, prohibition of collecting unnecessary personal data, or the uptake of anonymization processes to mitigate risks. This model uh, is, in fact, consistent with uh, the approach taken by some EU member states in Canada, for instance. Uh, um, but it, it is worth mentioning um, that these are not independent or isolated models. They're nothing but complementary, actually. Moving forward in, in the paper, we argue that a legal framework um, to protect anonymity under the umbrella of the right to privacy would suit these complementary models best. Privacy is an opacity tool in a constitutional democracy, and there are family resemblances uh, to connect, that connect the idea of anonymity to the concepts of identity, autonomy, confidentiality, secrecy, and so on. That's why we understand anonymity under the broad notion of, of privacy a freedom from unreasonable constraints on the construction of one's own identity. In other words, online anonymity fits the remit of this um, an absolute fundamental right that makes room for one to be true to himself without the fears of being nonconformist while navigating uh, through online life. Um, having said that, we, we find that a right to online anonymity must accommodate protections uh, uh, on traceable and traceable anonymity and also in data minimization. Uh, in the last part of uh, this last part of my talk, um, I want to just bring up how this Brazilian legal system protects this right. Um, laying down its foundation on the constitutional uh, right to privacy, anonymity on the internet is legally protected uh, in Brazilian system, at least in three different ways. First, um, as for traceable anonymity on online uh, platforms, Article 13 of the Internet Bill of Rights, Max Building Tenech, states that internet access providers must retain personal data uh, and internet connection logs, IP address, date and time, uh, for one year. Also, um, for profit application service providers are required to store access to application logs for six months under Article 15. The important aspect. Um, here is that both kind of internet service providers have confidentiality duties over the database uh, of logs. And at the end of the day, this framework allows users uh, to enjoy some benefits of anonymity without putting in danger accountability, given the fact that um, in case of illegal behavior, uh, law enforcement authorities could access such information to identify the perpetrator uh, should them have a judicial authorization. Um, second, um, there's you know untraceable online yeah, browsing, and um, okay, time is up. Sorry, two oh, minutes left. Two minutes. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, so untraceable and un untraceable online browsing and other legitimate uses of cryptographic tools, protocols, and techniques is uh, another form. In a pending case uh, before the federal Supreme Court about the constitutionality of some of some provisions of the Internet Bill of Rights, as well as the legitimacy of end-to-end -end encryption tools, 
Justice uh, Louise Alison Fokin stated in his opinion that, quote, the constitutional prohibition of anonymity does not have to, the reach to prevent uh, or make the protection of privacy infeasible, quote. And he follows highlighting how important uh, anonymity and encryption are to the protection of the rights to privacy, he resolved. Despite being an obiter dictum statement, it is powerful and worth noting because it denotes the legal grounds of one's interest of not being subject to online tracking and other surveillance practices. So in wrapping up this third um, last form of, of protection of, anon of anonymity, um, there is the principle of necessity. According to uh, the Brazilian General Data Protection Regulation, the principle of necessity uh, which is uh, uh, um, like the equivalent for the EU um, GDPR uh, data minimization principle. Um, this principle determines the limitation of the processing of personal data to the minimum necessary to achieve its purposes. It means that controllers should process only relevant, proportionate, non-excessive uh, data in relation to the purposes of the processing. Should data controllers abide by this legal norm, individuals would be protected against um, data aggregation, uh, covert profiling practices, and, and it's still in effects. So um, we're, we're time up. So just maybe if you could just wrap it up for us now. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm finished. So thank you. Um, sorry for taking a, a, a running out of time. Not at all. Thank you very much. That was excellent. What and, and another perspective, um, so helpful, and also digging into these definitions and our understanding around anonymity in more detail. Thank you. Okay, so now we turn to our final paper, um, which is going to be presented by Dr. Bertie Vidgen, who's CEO and co-founder of Rewire, formerly of the Turing Institute in Oxford University. And I believe this paper is also co-authored with Paul Rotger, but Bertie is pre presenting on their behalf today. But I'll hand over in the interest of time to Bertie now, and then we can have uh, open to our discussion afterwards, um, led by Jeff. Awesome, cool. Thank you very much. So hopefully you can see my uh, my slides. Is that okay? Cool. I can see some nodding. Good. So uh, yes. Yeah, so I'm from a startup called Rewire. Uh, Paul, um, and he led actually a lot, a lot of the thinking on this. So whilst I'm the one presenting it, it certainly um, in large part comes from him. Um, I'm going to talk about whether, uh, so what personalized content moderation is and why it may or may not be a good idea. So a little content warning, um, I will be showing a small amount of toxic language and talking about it. Um, so just, just to make you aware of that before we get going. But I think I'll start from something which I think is now quite well established, this kind of agreement problem with content moderation. So content moderation is how platforms like Twitter or TikTok are deciding what their users can and cannot see. So when it comes to things which are clearly illegal, so child abuse imagery or terrorist propaganda, um, they do immediate takedowns, and that's actually fairly well established what they need to do and the processes that need to be in place to deal with that. Uh, this is also the case for very overt forms of hate, which either are clearly harmful and clearly um, very, very obviously violating uh, their terms and conditions, or in cases where they think it may even cross into being illegal. One of the big challenges with hate is that um, the laws around it are not particularly well formulated, so that's always a slight challenge trying to comment on the legality. Um, and then on the other side, so if we have that at one end, which is relatively straightforward to handle, then at the other end, we have content that's actually relatively um, easy to deal with because it's clearly not going to violate any policies. It's clearly not causing any harm. It's, it's just kind of everyday content which people want to share. The challenge that we have is what do you do about the stuff that sits in the middle where it's no longer clear cut um, and where there's this kind of disagreement about what we should do. And actually it's this, it's this kind of content which all the research shows is where people disagree or where the majority of disagreements take place. Now, the idea really with content moderation, or at least the, the fundamental trade-off that we see is always between protecting people from harm. So how do we make sure that people are not being exposed to hazardous content that creates really serious risk of harm, but also protecting free expression. And I think something that we've been very passionate about in the company and before when we were uh, all doing research 
is how do we protect both these things at once? Um, and a lot of the challenges that we actually see at the moment is doing enforcement problems. It's re fairly reasonably well-formulated policies being really badly enforced, which means that people are either being exposed to harm or they're just being taken off the site when they shouldn't be. We did a lot of work last year with civil society organizations around the Holocaust and Holocaust Remembrance Days. Lots of them found their content was being moderated because platforms were just applying very rubbish moderation processes. Um, and because they're talking about the Holocaust and about Nazis, they flagged it up as being potentially dangerous. That's clearly an over moderation. That's clearly a problem. So I'm going to take this uh, one piece of content. Um, this is actually from a recent study by Martin Sapp and some of his colleagues. Um, and they had 641 annotators rate it for how offensive they found it on a scale of one to five. Now, most people found this completely fine. And I'm not going to read it out, but you can see it's a fairly benign statement. Um, but a small amount of people actually did think that it's a problem. So this very small amount of people said, right, this is a problem. Um, if we can find a way of separating these people out, if we can find a way of making it so that these people are not being exposed to this content, then essentially we've optimized the outcome for everyone. So the people who are totally fine with seeing this sort of content, they can see it. People who are not, they don't have to see it. Insofar um, as this is a question of personal preference, this kind of makes sense. If it truly is, there are no other societal implications of this. It really is just a sense of standard algorithmic optimization problem. Now, I wouldn't say that I'm here to try and say whether this is a good or bad idea. And I think actually one of the interesting things at the moment is, I mean, I certainly haven't made up my mind on, on what whether we think personalized content moderation is good. I think there's very few examples of it actually happening in the real world. So it's something that we're talking about more than we're seeing, but it is a very real possibility. And so I think it's something we need to engage with now rather than waiting for it to happen and potentially it being pretty problematic and pretty challenging. Um, you know, we, we heard very briefly earlier a comment on, on Twitter. And I think, you know, the, the massive changes we're seeing with Twitter or sort of Meta laying off a lot of people working on trust and safety. This may mean that personalized content moderation, um, which has been very closely linked to the kind of middleware or um, vendor market, which I'll talk about in a moment, that actually could become a reality. I think this, this could be the time that we see personalized content moderation happening. But first, let me talk about some of the advantages that we'll have. So the biggest one is that it solves this kind of single choice dilemma when we have a diversity of personal preferences. So put simply, everyone can decide what is safe for them. Everyone's kept safe. Nobody is restricted in their freedom of expression. Sorry, is that clicking? There we go. Sorry, for some reason it wasn't clicking for me. Um, so this is good because what's safe for you might not be what's safe for me. The second big advantage is that personalized content moderation empowers users rather than the platform owners. So right now, pretty much all these decisions are being made at the platform level. And even if we look at any of the new regulation coming in, like the online safety bill or um, the DSA, DMA, or even the AVMSD, which came in, uh, I think, last year, this is all still a very platform-centric approach. And what does the platform think is right? Are they enforcing their, their policies in the right way? Actually, if we have personalized content moderation, there could be a way to empower users to have more control over what they're seeing and what they're engaging with. This kind of avoids this kind of top-down, one-size-fits-all approach, which honestly um, does not have a huge amount of legitimacy if we think about it as a sort of democratic problem. But there are some very clear risks. So the first one is the risk of increasing fragmentation and polarization in online communities. Personalization is already very widely used across social media. So if you go to Twitter or Instagram, most people are being shown uh, content that an algorithm thinks they're likely to engage with pretty much for the sole purpose of keeping them engaged. So if we basically think of this logic as now being applied to content moderation, it could just be a further extension of that. And that's not necessarily a good thing. So we could see it amplifying echo chamber effects um, we could see some other challenges in terms of breaking people apart, having more um, fragmentation. The academic evidence on echo chambers, I think, is actually quite mixed. And maybe you know, a few years ago, people were like, this is definitely a big problem and we need to solve it. And I think it's now not so clear that echo chambers are such a simple problem as we thought. Um, but certainly it's a risk. 
The other big risk I'd say is that it may amplify the spread of toxic content. So if this, re you know, if we took personalized content moderation to the extreme and we said that platforms will only get rid of stuff that's illegal and everything else just becomes a question of choice, uh, which you could certainly imagine happening on something like Mastodon, which has a very decentralized approach, then we could definitely imagine thriving, hateful groups where they're seeing racist and anti-Semitic posts and they're not doing anything about it because they don't have any issue with it. They don't see any problem with it. Um, and that's a big issue because they might actually, um, there might still be societal consequences, problems of that sort of content existing um, and even radicalization processes that they go into. So I think there is obviously a risk of this very individual logic that goes behind the idea of personalized content moderation. So I think it should be clear that if we talk about personalized content moderation, we shouldn't just be thinking about everyone gets to see exactly what they want to see all the time. It's, a, it's probably more of a holistic system design challenge um, that we need to think about a lot more carefully. So I think there should be a few things to take into account here. There probably needs to be a limit to personalization. There needs to be some minimum bar, some sort of standard that we can set, definitely illegal content, probably also um, other other forms of content which create, which create a very clear risk of harm. The other thing is that we need to think about what counts as being in the gray area. You know, there's kind of uncertainty about what people are uncertain about. It's not entirely clear where people, um, where, where we have these areas of disagreement that personalized content moderation could be suitable for. So we Two have minutes to be very left. clear about that. Thank you. Um, and then, of course, the other one is who's actually going to do this? Is this something that the platform should be doing? Or is this something that we can have a middleware market, so that's third party vendors coming in and offering that personalization? That would require a huge amount of coordination and work. It's not straightforward who would want to do that. It's also not um, clear that the incentives are in the right place for everyone to do that. So we need to think very carefully about how this can actually be implemented. Now, I'm going to move through this relatively quickly, and I don't actually know if those. Are they coming up? Well, I was going to move through this quickly anyway. So basically, the, the question here is, how do we find out what users want? Do we give something that's more explicit? So actually just asking people, do we do something more implicit to understand their preferences, like looking at their behaviors and characteristics, like what they've liked to engage with? And what and how do we actually make this happen, potentially through the use of AI? Because it is going to be a problem of scale if we want to do this for everyone on the internet. Um, and then very finally, I just want to comment on, there are a few people out there, such as my company, um, who are starting to do this. Block Party is probably the biggest one doing it on Twitter. Um, but without real buy-in from the platforms, without the platform saying they want to encourage more personalization, it's never really going to work for third-party vendors. It's always a bit hacky, always a bit of a workaround. Um, so I'll finish there and uh, yeah, very happy to take questions and thank you for listening. Thank you, Bertie. That was wonderful and for giving, you know, ending with this sort of pra the practical reality of thinking of, you know, about platform design and so on, giving us lots to think about. Uh, my name is Richard Danbury. I am chairing the next session. The next session is on surveillance and data security. Um, we have from 10.15 until 11.15. Uh, we have three papers, Staying Safe and Secure, Cybersecurity, Surveillance and Journalism in Scotland. Paper one. Paper two, Repercussions on the Crime of Phishing in Private Law. Uh, and paper three, Conceptualising Data-Driven Outputs in Policing and National Security as Intelligence, in inverted commas, in order to improve understanding of efficient efficacy and governance of effect, governance effectiveness. Sorry for stumbling over that title. Discussant is uh, uh, Paul Bernal, who has very kindly just said he can hear me. I'm very, I very much hope everyone else can hear me as well. Um, uh, I won't, if it's all right with everyone, introduce the uh, people who are going to present the papers um, because I don't want to curtail on the rather short time we have to discuss a, a very important topic. Um, so, uh, if you want to, please uh, do have a look at the um, the the the, the, uh, the brochure, which is available online. I'm actually looking at another screen over there. But if it's all right, I will turn immediately to our first uh, um, paper: "Staying Safe and Secure: Cybersecurity Surveillance um, and Journalism in Scotland." Um, and if everyone's ready, I think who's going to this? Is David? Is it you who can give this one? Uh, no, it's Angela uh, presenting. Angela, forgive me, yeah. Angela. Hello, Angela. Hi everyone, I hope you can hear me okay? Yes, okay. Good to go. Let's go. Right, I've got uh, some slides to share, um, which I'll just do just now. Okay, I hope you can all see that as well. Um, yep, we got it. Okay, great. 
All right, hi everyone. Um, thanks a lot for having us. I'm Angela Daly and I'm presenting this on behalf of my uh, colleagues and collaborators as well, uh, Dr. David McMenemy and Dr. Elaine Robinson. Um, and I'm going to talk about um, a report and some research that we've been doing over the last, I guess, six months. Um, this might not be very easy. I, I am, I'll probably put this in the chat later or someone can do it at the same time. Um, but basically what I'm talking about is research that we published recently in a report uh, which you can download. A few lucky people got some paper versions which were actually made to look like a newspaper. Um, but for everyone else, it's just a um, downloaded report. So if you're interested, please have a look. Um, so basically, what is the research about and what does the report contain? Um, we've been working on this research for nine months. Um, it was funded by the Royal Society of Edinburgh as a collaboration with colleagues in Australia on cybersecurity research. Today, I'm going to talk just about some of the Scottish components of that. Um, why are we looking at Scotland? Well, partly it's because that's what we got funded to um, look at. Um, that's kind of what the Royal Society of Edinburgh tends to fund, um, but there are also kind of specificities of journalism and the kind of cyber security context in Scotland, which are different to, or we think anyway, are different to England, Wales, Northern Ireland, um, et cetera. So hopefully uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and why Australia? Well, that is what um, the funding was for, um, but we we specifically decided to look at journalism because our colleagues in Australia, uh, Monique Mann and Dermot Harkin from Deakin University, have done a companion study of cybersecurity um, surveillance and journalism in the Australian context. They also have a report um, available as well, uh, which hopefully we'll put in the chat so people can have a look um, later. I'm also not going to talk a lot about their work, um, just because uh, for interests of time, in the interests of time, also I would have to give a bit more context about Australia, which I don't really have time to do. Um, but there is quite a bit more that I haven't mentioned that um, kind of relates to their work and the comparison between um, the two places. So what we did in terms of this research is um, a literature review of cybersecurity surveillance and journalism in the Scottish context. It's quite interdisciplinary. I come from a legal background, uh, but David and Elaine don't. <laughs> They're more from uh, information studies, uh, media and communications. Um, so we have approached this in an interdisciplinary way. Um, and we also conducted a series of qualitative interviews with Scotland-based journalists over the summer or the our summer, July and August. Um, and what I'm going to present really draws kind of upon that. Um, so however, just kind of to give some background on this whole um, topic, um, like many other areas or all other areas, uh, digital technologies um, have benefits and also present challenges to journalism and the media. Um, various ways in which getting information and disseminating information and new kinds of information are possible, but also risks uh, to the security of journalists, including their cyber security and ways in which the use of digital tech can facilitate surveillance. I'm sure this isn't news to kind of anyone here. Um, lots of concerns um, in this context for freedom of expression, privacy, access to information, defamation, and data protection of journalists and their sources. And that's not, that's not specific to Scotland or Australia. That is um, a kind of global phenomenon. There's not been very much research that has been done on this topic in the Scottish or even UK context. Um, some previous research that was um, conducted by Scottish Pen uh, on writers rather than journalists or as a broader category, writers, um, uh, which included, I believe, some journalists, did note um, that um, as regards perceptions and actualities of surveillance, writers in Scotland did um, perceive there to be chilling effects um, and kind of self-censored to some extent on the basis um, that they were concerned about surveillance or actually surveillance was happening. And that was conducted a few years ago. I think, David, you were involved with that. Um, and it was very much kind of in the wake of the Snowden revelations. In the UK context, more generally, um, various UK journalists have been the targets of spyware, particularly Pegasus, uh, at least from what's publicly available. We're not aware of Scotland-based journalists who were specific targets of Pegasus, but um, that may well have been the case. And it's certainly something that um, journalists throughout the UK have to be um, aware of. 
As regards kind of skills and resources for journalists and media um, institutions, um, in a very general sense, there's a very the literature um, shows a very wide variety of views, skills, resources regarding cybersecurity and information security. Um, quite some journalists are very clued up on it. Some media organisations are very clued up, and some are not. Um, and sometimes some have had to get. Um, more information and more uh, resource um, and skills because there has been a kind of cyber security or surveillance incident that that journalist or that um, media institution has been involved with. Um, this is all taking place as well as the Pegasus spyware being used about, uh, against certain UK journalists. Um, the context of the UK, um, you know, we have the Snowden revelations from now almost 10 years ago, um, which um, obviously very kind of well known. Um, we also have some kind of specificities in different parts of the UK. So there have been police raids um, under the Official Secrets Act on investigative journalists in Northern Ireland. Uh, general concerns with journalists, cyber and physical safety um, throughout the UK, including with regards to online harassment, death threats that can spill over into, well, death threats have spilled over into kind of a threat to physical safety, um, but other forms of threats to physical safety that um, <clears throat> journalists have encountered from a wide variety of sources, by the way. Uh, we've got the ongoing issue of the Julian Assange extradition to the US, um, again on espionage, uh, espionage charges. Um, and we also have seen various cyber attacks against uh, UK journalists, um, in addition to the use of Pegasus. Um, so, by the way, a lot of these attacks are not made public. Um, they happen, particularly as we found in our research, they happen to media institutions, but often they don't make them public. Uh, but a couple of prominent ones that have been uh, made public in the last year have been the hack and leak of London-based journalist Paul Mason's emails, possibly from Russian-aligned um, uh, attackers, and also a uh, denial of service attacks against Bella Caledonia. For those who don't know Bella Caledonia, it's a Scottish, uh, I'd say somewhat pro-independence um, arts, cultural and politics website, and um, basically run by one guy, Mike Small, uh, who went public about um, the DOS attacks, basically to help uh, fundraise for um, a more secure server to be used, but quite unusual. Um, I think that was very much to do with the nature of the kind of operation, uh, which is a very much a kind of crowdfunded operation, um, but some of the bigger, more commercial um, media institutions also experience cyber attacks, but tend not to um, make them public. Um, as well, in terms of policy, we also have the UK's national cyber strategy that recognises that cyber attacks um, can pose threats to many kind of aspects of our critical infrastructure, but specifically also democratic institutions and the media. Um, so that's kind of important uh, to bear in mind. Okay, so I'm going to talk very briefly, I think I've only got five minutes left, um, or six minutes perhaps, about some of the findings from our interviews, uh, which we've grouped under a couple of themes, one of which is awareness and preparedness with regards to cybersecurity and journalism uh, for the 10 Scottish-based journalists that we spoke to. So. The journalists that we spoke to recognised that there was a various kinds of cyber threats, and some of them are not just cyber threats, from various sources. So the UK um, uh, security agencies sometimes, uh, depending on the kind of work the journalists do, but also um, the agencies of other countries, and in particular um, countries that were mentioned were China, Russia and Saudi Arabia. Um, and that kind of really pertained to journalists working on certain stories, including in the Scottish context, that perhaps were critical of the activities of um, these countries within Scotland um, and even beyond Scotland as well. Um, and that those journalists felt that there could be kind of cyber threats as a result of that activity. But also um, other journalists or the same journalists also talked about threats from a wide variety of other sources, including private companies, uh, just random individuals on the internet and also organized crime if um, the journalists were reporting on uh, criminal matters. Um, as well, um, the journalists were generally worried about surveillance. They perceived it to be happening, um, but they didn't really know 
if it was happening or not, um, but the threat that it was happening or the perception um, they were concerned about, but they were very much resigned to its existence, so to operating in this kind of environment. When we ask them questions about the UK legislation, and it is mostly UK-wide legislation governing surveillance, um, such as Investigatory Powers Act and RIPA, um, some of them had some awareness of it, but they had no detailed knowledge. And some of them actually thought there were better protections for journalists and their sources in that legislation than there actually are. One of the things that came out really strongly from our interviewees was um, concern about online harassment. So they viewed that we didn't define what cybersecurity was, um, but to them, we just kind of asked them questions about cybersecurity um, and their perceptions, but they very much associated online harassment um, as it, with their cybersecurity. Um, and they also associated it with something that could then lead to surveillance, particularly by, well, individuals who were engaging in that um, harassment. They also pointed to resources in general being a very big issue. Um, I don't, David and Elaine can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't really um, think any of them <laughs> said that they had particularly good um, resources coming, maybe one actually, but the, um, most of the journalists did not have very good resources with regards to um, how to keep themselves cyber secure um, and safe from surveillance coming from their institutions. And also I should say it was a mixture of free freelance and um, employed journalists that we spoke to, but that was consistent across both. In terms of the impact of cybersecurity and surveillance, uh, we found that uh, the journalists uh, that we spoke to used various tactics uh, to address the threats and risks that they perceived or that they encountered. And one um, prominent one was actually just not using technology at all. Um, certain um, of our interviewees pointed to just meeting people in person and um, sometimes kind of not using phones at all, uh, putting them away. And um, they perceived that as being safer <laughs> than using any kind of technology you can't have. Well, you can have some cybersecurity issues uh, with no tech, but it certainly was a kind of blunt way to reduce that. Um, they were generally concerned about protecting their sources and the security of communications that they had with their sources, uh, which kind of is related to the earlier point. So sometimes they would just meet people offline um, in kind of public places um, for um, to kind of address security and surveillance threats. Um, in terms of whether cyber security, security issues and surveillance deterred journalists from pursuing stories, they very adamantly said it didn't at all, but defamation was um, the area of law that they encountered that was kind of the, still the most chilling um, and the most problematic. And very briefly, for those who don't know, Scotland has just reformed its defamation laws, basically to bring it in line with England and Wales, um, but the journalists didn't really view that as being adequate. Um, there was also a lot of concern um, about the impact of online harassment and how that would impact upon the future of journalists and journalism in Scotland. I think I don't have very much time, so I'm going to skip over this uh, slide and just say that we came um, up with three recommendations uh, with regards to policy and to some extent law reform um, on the basis of the research. So certainly more an ongoing cybersecurity education and support for journalists and media organisations was clear. That was a clear kind of need from um, our research and also the need for there to perhaps to be different kinds of education and support for individual journalists, including those working uh, as employees and on the one hand and media organizations kind of more as an organization or a business on the other hand. Um, and so that we needed to kind of, or we advised that these be uh, perceived in slightly different ways because there's slightly different needs. Um, also kind of more legal protection, support and education for journalists um, in Scotland, uh, needed uh, as a result of our findings, um, the fact that most of them didn't really have a good idea of what the laws were that they operated under uh, was somewhat concerning. And like I say, the perception is that they had more protection than they actually did. Um, and also kind of going to the, that point I just made before about kind of the longer term sustainability for journalism um, and the issues with online harassment, um, more resources is, are needed to kind of ensure that we still have 
um, journalism in Scotland, um, which is you know within uh, the nation um, and that is has some kind of sustainable financial basis as well. And the Scottish uh, government, I think, commissioned um, a working group, independent working group, to look at that issue of sustainability for the future of journalism and Scot public interest journalism in Scotland. But it didn't actually talk about anything to do with cyber security or surveillance or tech. So if that kind of work is progressed and if um, the Scottish government acts on um, that working group's report, uh, we would like them to see some consideration of this aspect as well. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed. That was a whistle-stop tour. Uh, thank you very much, Andrea, David and Elaine. I should say that I was actually teaching cybersecurity to a class of, uh, of investigative journalists on Monday, and next Monday I'll be teaching source protection to another class of journalists. So this is absolutely fascinating from my point of view. Um, it'd be lovely to have a conversation with you afterwards about uh, it. Perhaps you can come down and talk to my crew about it all. But uh, it's not for me to talk about your paper. That'll be Paul later on. So we'll leave uh, questions and comments later on in the poll. But thank you very much indeed, Angela um, and David and Elaine. I think now we are going to turn to Sylvia. Uh, Sylvia is going to talk to us about repercussions of the crime of phishing in private law. So Sylvia, I will hand over yes. to you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. First, let me say a few words of thanks uh, to the conference organizer and the Institute of Advanced Studies in London for this very great event. Let me also thank my university, the University of Padua, for allowing me to be here today. I am Silvia Cosatti. I'm a second year PhD student at the University of Padua in Italy, and I'm delighted to be here with you today. My speech will focus on the repercussion in Italian private law of the crime of phishing, which is one of the most widespread cybercrime. But before getting to the heart of the discussion, I would like to say a few introductory words about technology and the impact it has on law. Certainly, technology brings with it uh, incredible advantages, but at the same time, it brings also known dangers that we have to deal with. Thanks to technology, we can carry out transaction and operation, even complex one, uh, easily. For example, until a few years ago, to carry out a banking operation, I had to physically go to the bank and carry it out with a bank operator, while today I can make it wherever I am at any time. But on the other hand, uh, the risks are different and there is no specific regulation at the regu regulatory level. The development of technology has generated the proliferation of new criminal re relevant behaviors, and we must understand how to regulate these behaviors. As you know, Italian criminal law is governed by the penal code, in which all the main crimes are governed. But the case of phishing was not foreseen by the Italian legislator and it remains a widespread crime. In, the fact, in fact, according to the annual report of the European Network and Information Security Agency, phishing represents one of the top 15 cyber threats. What is phishing? A definition could already derive from the term used to name the crime. The expression phishing comes from the English verb to fish, and so it is a clear metaphor. But to better understand the meaning of phishing, we can go back to the European Network and Information Security Agency that uh, define it uh, as the mechanism of creating messages based on social engineering mechanism that aims to persuade victims to disclose personal information, such as credit card details. The report says that phishing attacks are a means to persuade potential victims into divulging sensitive information and it provides a combination of social engineering and deception. The attack usually takes the form of spam mail or malicious website, appearing to be from a legitimate source, such as a bank or a social network. The attacker often uses scare tactics or urgent requests, and these fraudulent messages are usually not personalized and may share similar generic properties. But what does really this phenomenon consist of? The feature sends fake messages, and in the text of the communication, there is a link. The victim will click on the link and will be trapped in the net placed by the fisherman. Over time, obviously, different methodologies have been developed to implement phishing, and they are a modality in perpetual evolution due to the technological progress. The most used technique is the deceptive phishing, 
um, the Fisher sends email which uh, reproduces the real sites and sender because they must generate the greatest trust to the recipient who must be encouraged to click on the link. And the link will send it back to a site almost identical to the original one, but which is actually a fake. A malware is also used to do this. This is a software installed on the victim computer to monitor the user activities. Another modality is the man in the middle, in which the fissure intervenes between the user and the official site and takes advantage of the communication between the user and the legitimate recipient of the information, intercepting their messages and using their content. Even more particular and sophisticated is the method of farming. Uh, in this case, we have a manipulation of the DNS addresses that the user uses, which when he logs in, for example, bank's account, it, it will actually be uh, translated on a site tailored by the cyber criminal. From what I've said so far, it seems that phishing is a case that only concerns criminal law. But in my opinion, it should be noted that this is a really reductive vision because obviously other law branches are inevitable influenced by the phishing. And in particular, I believe that the private law is equally affected by the problem. In fact, many repercussions are also on private law side where we try to understand who should respond and compensate for any damages, what are the parameters of the bank's liability what is the source of the bank's liability and in what terms there may be a concurrence of liability of the account holder. In this regard, I will now try to analyze some of the decision with which the Italian ABF, the uh, ABF is the financial banking arbitrator, an out of court dispute resolution system provided by the Italian law. And our courts have taken a position on the crime of phishing and on non-banking fraud. In Italy, in fact, we have had several, several decisions, mainly from the jurisprudence of merit, but also of legitimacy. For example, in 2012, the court of Syracuse sentenced Post Italiane Spa, um, it is like a banking operator, to compensation for damages suffered by a current account holder who was the victim of a case of phishing, according to Article 15 and 31 of the legislative decree number 196 of 2003 and according to Article 1176 of the Italian Civil Code, applicable to all mandatory contractual relationship, which establishes that uh, in fulfilling the obligation, the debtor must use the diligence of the bonus pater familiae. And in particular says that in fulfilling the obligation inherent in the exercise of professional activity, diligence must be assessed with regard to the nature of the acti activity performed. So in carrying out payment services via the internet, Poste Italiane is required to adopt all technical measures suitable to guarantee an adequate standard of security in making payments in order to prevent access by person not authorized to the system and avoid damages to the customers. Two years later, the Court of Florence said that Poste Italiane, like any other banking operator, in contractual relations with the customer responds according to the rules of the mandate and the diligence to which it is required must be evaluated with particular rigor. In particular, with a specific reference to the use of service and tools with a payment or other function with which make use of mechanical or electronic means, it's essential for the purpose of conferring related responsibility to verify the adoption of a, by the establishment of suitable measures to guarantee the safety of the services. We have also um, several, several decisions of the Court of Cassazione. The Court of Cassazione in particular intervenes in a case in which a current account order, um, always with Poste Italiane, had suffered the theft of her online assets credential to the account, following which a transaction not authorized by the account holder was carried out. In this case, the Supreme Court, in the light of the legislative uh, framework outline, clarifies also that the credit institution is liable as owner of the processing of personal data for damages resulting from not having prevented third parties from illegally entering the customer's telematic system by capturing its asset code. 
if it does not prove that the harmful event is not attributable to it, as it's due to the negligence of the person concerned or to false mayor. For example, uh, so the bank has to give the demonstration that the account holder has behaved in a way that does not comply with the normal diligence required in keeping their personal data. And this is very important. We have, we have also um, a decision of the Court of Cassazione that two years later established that uh, um, in the case of transactions carried out with electronic devices and tools, um, so the on banking, it is up to the credit institution to verify the traceability of the same to the will of the customer using the diligence of the shrewd banker. Any use of the system assets called by third parties fall within the professional risk of the payment service provider, which can be foreseen and avoided with appropriate technical measure aimed at verifying the traceability of the aforementioned transaction to the will of the account holder. So, the court says, the bank is not liable for the damage suffered by the customer, only if it proves that the fact is attributable to the owner's willful misconduct or to such reckless behavior that it cannot be dealt with it in advance. More frequent in Italy are the decision of the ABF, but for reason of time, I cannot analyze them all. So I will only stop briefly on uh, the last one I found. Uh, it is a decision of April 2022. And with this decision, the ADF intervenes on the issue of online fraud. Um, intervenes particularly on the operating method of the so-called strong authentication, uh, on the obligation borne by the payment service provider, and also on the obligation borne by the user. And in this case, uh, um, the ABF, um, with a very long uh, decision, said that uh, if the intermediary does not comply with the procedure established for online operation, the responsibility for fraudulent operation carried out on the customer's online current account falls only on the payment service provider. So in this case, the credit institution. We have also other decision of the ABF that uh, for reason of time, I can't uh, analyze, but uh, this is the situation of uh, uh, the decision in our system. And so thank you for the attention. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Silvia, and thank you very much for keeping to time. I could see that you felt a bit pressed there. So it's such a shame. It would be lovely to hear more from you. Um, uh, it's uh, it's quite an appropriate thing to be talking about. Um, I don't know if it was in you, you, you had the same coverage in Italy, but uh, the Sunday Times, which is one of our big newspapers, this Sunday their lead story, which was with the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, was about the Qataris um, hacking, uh, in particular those who were uh, campaigning against the World Cup. Um, and one of the mechanisms they were used for hacking people was phishing. So um, you know, very contemporary, very contemporary work there. Very interesting to hear it. Thank you very much indeed, um, Sylvia. Um, I now town turned for for the third one, uh, the third uh, paper to Marion, Luke, and Angela. Um, uh, and I think from a slide I can see on the screen here, it may be Marion talking to us. But I will leave that to uh, the third uh, researchers group of researchers to to take it from here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard, and thank you very much to the conference for inviting us. Um, we're, we're here to talk to you about our work, um, thinking about how we might uh, conceptualise AI in policing and national security as intelligence, as in the information and uh, investigation type of intelligence. Um, and this fits within the wider context of concern around the um, consistency and effectiveness of scrutiny and oversight of policing technology and how it could be better evaluated, um, in particular set out in the House of Lords Justice and Home Affairs Committee recent report um, into technology in the justice system. Um, so we're, we're going to operate um, a bit of a tag team presentation for you today. Um, 
Luke is going to talk to us uh, a bit about the different definitions of intelligence, and it probably won't surprise you to learn that there are lots of them. Um, then Angela will take over and talk about why are the outputs of AI like intelligence, which just strikes me actually now as a like a beginning of a joke. Um, so we'll try and make it entertaining. Uh, I'll make some very brief comments about data protection and then Luke will talk to you about our idea about using an intelligence assessment matrix approach to better improve how we um, assess whether um, AI in policing is any good or not. So I'll hand over now to Luke and Angela. Perfect. Hopefully you can all hear me uh, quite clearly. There's quite a big room. Um, so yeah, when you look at the word intelligence, it actually has quite a wide variety of meanings, um, even within the intelligence community. Uh, it's used as both a noun and a verb, so you can use intelligence or you can do intelligence. Um, it's used by a wide variety of different agencies. You've got what's called intelligence agencies, and intelligence is their job, um, things like MI5 and the CIA. We also have uh, agencies like HMRC, um, who are revenue and customs. You've got border force for the borders, and they all use intelligence in their role. So uh, when it comes to intelligence, there's a lot of colloquialisms and things like that. So there's, there's quite a variety of meanings, but where we see a lot of convergence is, um, you know, it's a, a lot of people consider intelligence to be information that's been vetted for uh, accuracy, uh, relevance, um, and quality as well. So even though that's kind of the core meaning, you do see a lot of colloquialisms in um, kind of semi-official or non-official reports where intelligence is used um, with different bars of reliability. So where one agency could consider intelligence to information of a very high accuracy, other agencies will consider all information that comes to them as uh, intelligence. So if we get to the next slide here. We should see. Perfect. Um, so there are um, a variety of reasons why this matters. Uh, one of the reasons is that when different organizations using the word intelligence in different ways, it does make governance and oversight challenging when we're discussing what intelligence means or what counts as intelligence. Uh, it's quite difficult to regulate data-driven systems um, if that reliability bar is different, and what rules around intelligence would affect each organization differently. Now, where this kind of links into the greater theme is that even with the best discretion given to information that's analyzed, subsequent intelligence drawn from that, no matter where the reliability bar is, does, you know, it's by its nature uncertain and subjective. Now, I do know that Angela wants to expand on that, so I'll pass you over. Yeah, just on to the next slide here. Um, so we can see how the outputs of AI are like intelligence through looking at some examples of the reliance on AI to make decisions. Um, according to the UK's um, National Audit Office, um, Office's 2020 report, um, 120 million was spent on the build uh, on building the digital services at the border systems, the DSAB systems, by March 2019. And the report also states that there were significant risks um, in building these systems, and certain uncertainties remained, including the developmental um, capability, um, border crossing service availability as well as some um, as well as delivering secure software servers storage and networking they were also relying on legacy technology which needs to be upgraded and this picture here is of the um, eye border control virtual bodyguard um, designed by the Manchester Metropolitan University for EU border control and as seen by the eye border control case um, and Automated lie detector um, used at borders can be seen as a reliance on intelligence generated by the video um, detector technology. And it has been proven, as we all know, um, that similar facial emotion and gait recognition have high errors when it comes to data put into the systems um, from individuals who are not white, women, or um, individuals with a disability. And this is especially the case of biometric technologies um, deployed by police forces. For example, when um, facial recognition technology is used on CCTV footage. And now moving on to um, another prominent um, example of um, faulty um, artificial intelligence is the um, post office or horizon scandal. And this was when a computer system um, called Horizon had defects which caused errors in the accounts and this led to hundreds of sub-postmasters 
um, being wrongly accused of fraud and theft. And um, this is an example of an over-reliance on technology to make such decisions um, in prosecution, for example. So um, therefore, when we look at the lessons learned from examples of AI decision making, firstly, they have a level of uncertainty. Um, therefore, they are not facts. And um, secondly, when we combine intelligence, which is something that does not have a legal definition, um, and then we combine that with technology that is proven to have biases or inaccuracies, it is questionable how this is reliable. Thanks, Angela. So I said that I would just make some comments about um, data protection. Um, why, why are we thinking um, about different frameworks and methods when we already have the data protection principles? Um, as I think we would probably all agree, um, opinions are covered, opinions about people are covered by um, data protection law. Um, you may have read the excellent article by Hallinan and Borgesus um, around opinions in data protection law. Um, but I think there is still, um, still a, an issue when we think about the way that um, data-driven outputs are used within policing and national security. Um, these, um, these outputs are not necessarily based on the analysis of facts. They may actually themselves be based on the analysis of intelligence itself. And so the question then becomes, how, uh, how should we uh, assess the, the accuracy and reliability of the data that pops out the other side? Um, as the ICO has, has said, um, in many cases where you use data analytics, um, the outputs are not intended to be treated as facts. They're a statistical informed guess. Um, accuracy in the data protection context is different to statistical accuracy. Um, it requires you to take steps to make sure the personal data is not incorrect or misleading as to any matter of fact. Um, the fourth data protection principle in respect of law enforcement processing um, it requires police forces to think about transmissions of personal data when they're, they're using or transferring uh, the outputs of their analysis and to take steps to assess the degree of accuracy, completeness and reliability. Uh, so what we've been thinking about is how we might do that when we're considering uh, outputs of AI that uh, are themselves intelligence and actually may be based on the analysis of intelligence itself, not just the analysis of fact. So I'm going to pass back to Luke now for some final thoughts on how um, a, a, an approach similar to uh, the way that the police assess intelligence may be useful in this context. Absolutely. So um, as you can see from here, even though um, different kind of organizations have different um, levels or standards uh, or bars where information becomes intelligence, once something is intelligence, they actually have quite a uniform way of um, how they weigh that intelligence. So as you can see, uh, you have examples here from completely different organizations. You do see that a lot of them have the same kind of axes or the same things that they weigh. Um, this actually maps really, really well to AI outputs because AI outputs, when measuring either their own accuracy or reliability takes similar things into account. Um, so you do have, um, you know, you've got uh, weight sources and that's very, very similar to um, accuracy rates within software. Um, you've got information weight, which is not unlike positive or negative uh, matching um, within software itself. So, you know, when, when we are dealing with these matrices, we kind of already have a way that um, intelligence agents are very, very comfortable with. Uh, when they are weighing information. And therefore, if the outputs of data-driven systems were classed as intelligence themselves, because they've been uh, selected and kind of weighed in the same way, um, they're already put into an environment where uh, those kind of methods are, are you know, people are accustomed to, to handling them. 
Um, yeah, so essentially for these two reasons, reasons among others, um, the elves of these systems could benefit from being conceptualized as intelligence um, instead of being shoehorned into unfitting categories such as uh, personal data. Um, for this to be possible, there's more unison needed in how intelligence is defined, treated, and weighed uh, amongst law enforcement and national intelligence agencies. Um, so, Marion, turn it back to you if you would like to summarize everything. Thank you. That's that's uh, our conclusion. So what we're intending to do is to work some uh, more on developing such a matrix approach that would basically replace the, the sort of categories that are used um, to weigh standard intelligence with, with those sort of categories that are needed to assess um, data driven intelligence generation. Um, and we hope that this sort of method, as Luke said, would fit better with the way that policing bodies and national security um, uh, bodies think about information and reliability and therefore um, increase um, acceptance and consistency of um, considering uh, whether these types of approaches should be relied upon or not. So I, th I think we're, we're, we're done and hopefully on time. Thank you. Very oh, perfect. Much. Absolutely. Very, thank you very much indeed. Um, what a fascinating project, trying to get one group of people dealing with information flows in one sort of linguistic uh, area talking to another. Um, absolutely um, fascinating. It's, and good luck in trying to get a kind of um, uh, a firm grasp on the f slippery fish, which is the concept of intelligence. My PowerPoint, hoping that everyone can see it. and. Uh, I'm I'm sorry I have to use my uh, for have a good connect to have a good connectivity I have to use my fixed computer here at the office and uh, there is uh, for some reasons it only uh, it's only compatible with with Zoom when I use uh, PowerPoint sorry PDF not PowerPoint so the format is not as uh, uh, wonderful as maybe I'm sure Johnny's presentation with a lot of uh, very nice. Uh, and, and, and bombastic <laughs> effects is very traditional, but I hope that the content will be as as interesting uh, as the other fellow speakers. So uh, my my presentation will focus on the on what are the most recent, and there are a lot of updates in terms of um, online content safety mm -hmm. and security, and how this will will actually overlaps with also sovereignty discussions in the these five uh, countries, the BRICS grouping. Uh, first, let me just share a couple of uh, information, uh, well, some information, basic information about uh, my work. Uh, so I work at FGV Law School. As this is an international audience, I'm not sure everyone knows FGV is both one of the most uh, renowned academic institution in Brazil and actually ranked as the uh, third uh, most influential think tank in the world out of more than 11,000. And uh, at FGV, as Nora was mentioning, I coordinate the Center for Technology and Society and the Cyber Bricks project, which is precisely this project has been uh, dealing with the analysis and mapping of digital policies in the Bricks uh, grouping. Now, the uh, all the contents basically that I'm going to share uh, is uh, taken from a, this very recent article that is going to be published by the EU Institute, Institute of, Inform, of uh, in Information Security uh, in the upcoming months. So uh, it's a result of a conference organized by the Cyber Direct project with the EU Commission. And it's about the content regulation in the BRICS countries that I've uh, co authored with my uh, colleagues, Yasmin Kurzi and Walter Gaspar. Uh, now, the, first of all, what are the, what is the BRICS? I'm not sure everyone is familiar with. Uh, so it's a grouping that's it's quite unusual, it includes Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. So we have a very heterogeneous grouping uh, of countries with very different characteristics in political systems, regulatory systems. But what they have in common is that at the, uh, early, in the early 2000s, their projection of growth was so relevant that they were uh, packed into this acronym BRICS to stress the fact that in the upcoming 30 years, uh, this looking from the perspective of the early 2000s, uh, sorry, they would have had the most relevant ex uh, expansion in economic terms, becoming some of the leading uh, uh, economies in the 20s and 30s, which is actually what happened indeed. Uh, the philosophy 
behind the creation of this grouping. So this, the term was created by a Goldman Sachs economist, Jimmy O'Neill, uh, that the British may know also because also he integrated the, the British government. But then the acronym was not utilized until some year after when at the, at the initiative of the Russian government, the first BRICS meeting was convened. Um, and the BRICS started in 2009 to have these regular meetings. No head of state has ever missed a meeting, so they attach enormous importance to the meetings, uh, although it has a quite low profile. And the, the philosophy behind the BRICS was to create a, a multipolar order where global governance was not only the remit of developed country, but also could be organized for the benefit and taking into consideration the needs of the uh, global South, the majority world, right? So that we can see the BRICS as a sort of G5 uh, or G7 or G5 of the developing world. And uh, as former uh, president of Brazil and president-elect of Brazil, Ignacio Lula da Silva was mentioning, BRICS is not about copying other uh, institutions, but doing things differently, not to be dependent. So the philosophy behind it is to create a, an alternative, uh, which may be uh, more keen on listening to the problems and work towards the problem of the global south. And the fact that uh, Lula was one of the key figures behind the creation of the BRICS actually leads us to think that the BRICS will take a further relevance in the upcoming four years, uh, when the as soon as the new government in Brazil will will start working in general. Now, to come back to today's discussion, what are the, uh, the frameworks, normative frameworks regarding content, uh, what is considered to be considered safe content and, uh, and unsafe content online? Uh, we have also transformed this, uh, this uh, paper I was mentioning before in this map that you can see here. So where you can see that you can uh, check the legislation of the normative frameworks of the five BRIC countries with regard to, uh, to social media regulation. There are also other interactive tools like this on cyberbreeze.info. All everything is on is on, in open access, so feel free to access it. And so to start with Brazil, uh, there is a quite large number of uh, of norms, of provisions that regulate how uh, online content uh, could be can be shared, or, and this goes from the constitution to uh, the a most recent bill called also called the fake news bill, uh, bill uh, 2630 of 2020. And this is the most interesting part uh, for, for why? Because it has, well, I, the first iteration of the bill was highly controversial, then it has been updated and then, uh, sorry, most recently, the, uh, pr the president of the uh, electoral tribunal, after stating that the fake news situation in Brazil was a, a true disaster during the, the campaign, he explicitly asked the new president Lula to elaborate in a new regulation to uh, tackle fake news. So this will be most likely uh, reformulated and strengthened to deal with uh, fake news and disinformation in Brazil in the upcoming months. This is a priority of the new government. And so the uh, the goal of this bill at the current status is uh, to target coordinated actions in disseminating fake, fake news. Actually, it criminalizes this coordinated action in disseminating uh, this information, which is a process, progress since the uh, early version that targeted individuals criminally with uh, with criminal sanction for disseminating fake news. So it has been evolved, evolving. It also evolved the content the content tracing. Uh, uh, provisions that were very controversial at the very beginning, but have now have, can only be used after when they when they follow uh, previous intelligence work, and there is also a, a presumption of innocence and pr privacy and security provisions that have been added to this to make it a little bit more digestible. Uh, but what is interesting is also, and we will see in a couple of minutes, that it, 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 there is a lot of dialogue between this. Uh, proposal and the IT rules adopted by India uh, last year. And I will mention this in a couple of minutes, but not before mentioning Russia, which, as you might imagine, is, is not a really nuanced uh, uh, framework. It's very straightforward, uh, several uh, type of very broad, uh, several broad, very broad types of information are prohibited, including uh, information that misinformation about war or uh, insults against public officials 
and it, it can be this content can be easily removed uh, without court order uh, at the order of Roskom Nazor, which is the, the, the telecom czar of Russia. And also, this is very interesting when we come to the next BRICS country, India, because India, with the IT rules, combines elements of what was the, pre, the initial version of the Brazilian uh, bill. Uh, so content uh, traceability, uh, traceability obligation. Actually, this, the IT rules in India are enforced since 2021. So uh, uh, apps, uh, social media apps, they, they have to trace content. Uh, also, takedown is very similar to the Russian model. And so here we start to think, this, is this a coincidence? Uh, that there are these, from these very distant countries, there are so many similarities. It is not, uh, because actually in, in the aftermath of the Snowden revelations, the BRICS countries created a cybersecurity working group that constantly shares uh, good information and good practices or, or bad practices about how to deal with cybersecurity threats, like also threats to the security of, of uh, uh, political infrastructure, like fake news uh, in this case, and so this sharing of information on how to uh, tackle common problems has been going on since at least eight years. So it's for this reason, it's very uh, not an unusual to find similarities in the frameworks of the BRICS countries. Uh, now, China, uh, it's a very interesting item to analyze because it has been adopting a, a flurry of new regulations over the past two or three years, uh, including not only a new data protection law, data law, and cybersecurity law, but also the most interesting part for me is the regulation on algorithmic recommendation systems, which includes uh, a lot of uh, rights for users and duties for platforms that actually are very interesting to analyze. Because yes, of course, we can criticize the fact that there are very broad provisions in which kind of content could not be cannot be shared, but there is also very some a lot of very interesting provisions about the kind of uh, transparency and explicability of algorithms, the right of individuals to opt out from recommendations uh, defined by by uh, uh, platform providers. So there is a lot of very interesting provisions that actually other countries could look at in terms of regulation. Uh, of course, no one is telling that one has, should copy and paste from other uh, countries, but it's, it's very interesting to study to understand also the, the rationale behind it. And then to finalize, of course, last but not least, South Africa, that again has a very large number of uh, provisions regulating content, but the most relevant for me is the Film and Publications Act of 1996. It was updated only uh, three years ago by uh, President Sri Ramaphosa, uh, including the obligation for ISPs to, <clears throat> sorry, monitor and take down abusive and harmful content, including uh, war propaganda, incitement to violence, hate speech. But what is more, the most interesting part here is not really the, the, the structure of this bill, but that the bill has immediately been dubbed as the censorship bill. So the inter, this uh, amendment of the Film and Publications Act is well known in South Africa as the Internet Censorship Bill. And this leads me to the conclusion of my presentation, which is how really to regulate uh, online content. And I think that every kind of uh, regulator, any kind of government will face this conundrum, uh, the sledgehammer versus scalpel conundrum, meaning that uh, it is very, it, it is easier to use a sledgehammer to uh, try to uh, regulate content and remove unsafe comment, content, sorry. Uh, it is much more complicated to use a, a scalpel to surgically uh, remove only specific uh, nasty content uh, in a very uh, uh, skillful and eff effective ways. But the problem is that as soon as you try to do this, you will immediately in any democracy will be uh, called a censor. So it's politically extremely difficult uh, because there is a strong incentive not to regulate, to avoid being easily called a censor and on the other hand, if you do not regulate, <laughs> the situation is a mess, uh, to use the, 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 the terms, the, the very eloquent expression of the president of the uh, Brazilian Electoral Tribunal is a disaster. So something needs to be done, but the problem, uh, to, I, I haven't seen so far a single framework that uh, manages to both regulate and remove harmful content effectively 
but not without entering into something that can be easily be considered as censorship. And so with this uh, note of optimism, I would like to end my presentation and uh, look forward to hearing from the colleagues. Thank you very much. Well, thanks so much, Luca, for such an impressive comparative whistle-stop tour throughout the BRICS legal frameworks. I think it, you quite rightly note how actually Im impressive it is in terms of international collaboration of how data norms and the different approaches of each jurisdiction have been shared over the years with the overarching aim of dealing with cybersecurity threats in general. Um, I thought in particular that the, the metaphor you used at the end of your talk regarding ultimately how does one approach online moderation? Is it the sledgehammer approach, which a lot advocate for because of the communications and ICT systems we use? I think the term at scale has been used so often over the past two days that the moment anyone suggests a legal solution or a legal framework or a legal safeguard or a technical one, the question that follows afterwards is very much one of implementation and can that be done at scale but then if it is there is also then the compromise of of accuracy if you don't take the scalpel approach as i think you so wonderfully succinctly put it but then the implications of that are quite significant in terms of fundamental rights interferences particularly with the right to privacy and freedom of expression but also to a certain extent data security as well questions of encryption and how to examine encrypted material has come up quite consistently as well over the past two days. So I have so many more things to say and questions I could put to you, but I'll stop myself there. And thanks so much again for such a rich uh, presentation to kick off this panel, Luca. And we will turn next to our second speaker, Dr. Rhys Farthing. So Reese is the Director of Data Policy at Reset Australia. She works on realizing children and young people's rights in the digital world through policy and regulation. She has worked as an academic for not-for-profits and at think tanks based in Australia, the UK and the US, including the Five Rights Foundation and Fair Play. Reese, whenever you're ready, you're very welcome. Brilliant. Um, can people hear me okay? Working? Good. Um, look. Thank you for having me, and I have no idea how to follow up with Luca's um, incredibly broad and precise um, presentation, except by doing the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. So as a, as a non-lawyer, I'm more of a sort of policy and politics person. Um, I think it's always interesting to sit on interdisciplinary panels like this, um, partly because I learn so much, um, and I'm hoping maybe I can share a different way through. Um, so I wanted to keep my contribution as a conversational provocation more than anything. Um, and in my slide free seven minutes, um, I thought I, it was worthwhile highlighting from a policy um, perspective, what a genuinely interesting experiment we've created, comparatively speaking, um, when we look at Australia, where I am from, you might have spotted the accent, um, Fiji and the UK. Um, so I'll start off by pointing out Oh, and now that I say that, um, Luca, what a wonderful sort of global geographic mix we're creating here at this point. Um, but yesterday, for those of us who are here, Lorna General, uh, Lorna Woods rather, um, talked about a sort of spectrum, and I like the word spectrum of approaches to online safety regulation, which um, start with content and moderation um, approaches, or as being Australian, as we would call them, takedown approaches. Um, to systems and processes approaches to online safety um, regulations and legislations. And this spectrum, um, I think, or, or where people fall on this spectrum, really came about by um, political path dependency, particularly in Australia, as I'll describe. Um, but this political path dependency has created this wonderful, wonderful experiment almost. Um, so on this spectrum, I'll start, if I can, by talking about on this side on, on content moderation and takedown, um, but also it's a historically accurate um, starting point as well with Australia's Online Safety Act, which was passed in 2015. And I know the UK government won't like hearing this, um, but it genuinely was a world leading piece of legislation then. 
um, even though the UK uh, government keeps putting out press releases now saying, no, no, this is world leading. Um, you know, we can all be world leading in our own way. Um, but Australia's Act started out genuinely as, as purely and completely content moderation. And how this happened, at least from, from sort of my experience of being there at the time um, and, and the politics of it, was it was a political response to a, a sort of public rising concern about the online world and young people in particular. Um, and there was a really big sort of political appetite. There was, there was an awareness that something was wrong um, and there was a political appetite to do something, do something um, for the children. And there was a really big public concern around bullying at the time, which was um, marked by a couple of sort of significant um, incidents that made their way into the press. And so this sort of concern about the digital and concern about online bullying were married. And we landed on a focus to sort of pass through a law that was specifically around um, online bullying of children. That's sort of where the Online Safety Act started. And I think, you know, I appreciate that's a little background. Um, but it, it gives us an insight into how we started there. Um, because when you think about bullying and with children in particular, both the sort of bad actors in that space and the victims are children. We've got these children who are bullied and these children who are victims. Um, and because of that, because we were dealing with children, I think that's how we've ended up with this content moderation system. That is, if you're looking at how do we protect children from other children, you know, the bad actors here are children, what we did was we set up a public complaints mechanism for children's families and schools to report bullying. And then we set in place obligations for tech companies to take down bullying content if this complaint was investigated by our regulator and found indeed to be a valid form of abuse against an Australian child. Um, and you can see that when you sort of start from there, it almost makes sense when you're talking about bullying children that that's what you do. It, it's almost like a logical extension or corollary of like how we imagine that schools or families or any other institute dealing with children might manage bullying or poor behaviour. You know, you kind of bring these children together and you try and work out, well, what's going on? Who said what? OK, well, apologise and stop it. You know, that's the kind of general approach to bullying. And that's, it was just extended by law into tech companies. And I think that's how we ended up with the approach, at least from a political perspective that we have in Australia. And so that law gave us, an, you know, a complaint system, um, obligations for takedown, and it also set up the office of the e-safety commissioner. Um, and it was alongside this, this sort of complete takedown and content focus that our online safety regulator started developing a softer focus on systems and processes, so that other end of the spectrum. Um, and so that was with notable sort of um, progress, like we, we had all of those safety by design guidelines and toolkits and um, support for tech companies to sort of build safer. Um, but this was all very much voluntary and optional. And that was because that was the remit of our online safety regulator on, under the Online Safety Act. You could regulate hard on moderating child bullying content, but anything systemsy, anything else that was sort of more broad needed to be discretionary, um, needed to be a bit more, you know, soft policy in that sense. And it was this Online Safety Act, this very much, look, let's, let's deal with kids bullying each other, that was then expanded out to include other types of content like image-based abuse, pro-terror abuse, child sexual abuse material, and more recently, adult-based abuse, um, all the sort of bullying of adults, which is where, as, as Luke has sort of mentioned or, or um, highlighted, you, you come into real problems because we give our regulator a lot of space to interpret what's decided uh, or what's interpreted as abuse directed at adults. Um, it's pretty much at the regulator's discretion to decide whether that was legitimate, whether the content was legitimately designed to intimidate and would have the regular effect of intimidation. It's, it's quite broad and loose. Now, that's where we've sort of ended up with our Online Safety Act. But I think if we'd have started with that in mind, if we'd have started, if, if Canberra had started with an idea that this is going to be a bill that's going to deal with pro-terror materials, we might have taken a different approach like receiving complaint about pro-terror materials and then issuing a notice to take them down doesn't quite fit the sort of scale nor scope of that problem. But path dependency, I think, landed us there. And in 2020, Australia updated its Online Safety Act to add in some of these systems and processes elements. But you can see that those enhancing, th those sort of original path dependencies are still there in this approach as well. So the systems and process piece that Australia passed in 2020 
um, we wrote in things to our legislation called basic online safety expectations. And these are really softly and gently handled. So for example, the basic online safety expectations are entirely developed by ministerial discretion. It's up to the minister of the day to decide what the basic online safety expectations are so that they can move and shift and drift with the times. Um, and they're largely realised or largely implemented through the development of codes. Now, in Australia, codes are not what you might think they are. I'm not talking about the sorts of codes that we have in the UK or Europe where regulators draft codes. In the UK, we have a softer approach to codes again. Um, we have a, a uniquely Australian, I think, I believe it's uniquely Australian um, approach that we've been pioneering since the 90s in, in all our industrial relations called co-regulation, where basically we allow industry to draft their own codes um, and then regulators register these codes or sort of, you know, stamp them and oversee them. Um, and so codes in Australia are self-regulation in kind of all but name um, and, and a re, an extension of this sort of softer approach. And we saw in Australia, indeed, some of these um, Australian online safety codes were released in September this year as draft ones for consultation. And you can see almost in black and white how much tech really reveled in this softer approach. Um, so, for example, they proposed much weaker protections for children um, in Australia than in places where we see regulated drafted codes like the UK, Ireland, France, Sweden, Netherlands, and now California. So just as sort of one example, the requirement to default all children's accounts on social media or online gaming platforms or anything to the most private settings, that was a requirement that in any code that a regulator has gone near and drafted or a legislator has drafted, they said, yeah, that makes sense. All kids' accounts under the age of 18 must default to private. In Australia, because industry wrote our code, um, we decided that, okay, we'll have privacy by default, but only for those up until 16, um, so that Australian 17, 16 and 17 year olds wouldn't be protected in the same way because tech wrote this code. Um, and you see these, these similar weaknesses when it comes to GPS location requirements for children and young people and child sexual abuse and material reporting. So again, you know, because of this path dependency, we see this softer approach around systems emerging in Australia. And at this stage, I'd also like to give um, a plug to Fiji as a part of this story as well. Fiji passed the world's second only by name um, online safety act in 2018 that models the Australian approach in that it introduces a public facing complaint system and creates an e-safety commissioner. Um, and for, for here, uh, for the sort of purposes of our perfect experiment, um, there isn't necessarily a type of content that, that they focus on in Fiji as there is in Australia. It's very broad. It's focused on content that is likely to cause harm. Um, so even broader still. But it very much introduces this content moderation and takedown approach and allows for the development of softer takes on systems too. Um, and this might sound surprising and shame on us if it is, um, but Fiji is very much world leaders in this space. Um, this is very much a small island developing state, a leader in the Pacific Ocean region, and they're modelling a different way of regulation for online safety within the context of a much smaller nation. Um, so it's, you know, Luca mentioned some of the, the regulatory developments that were emerging in, in big countries with big populations. This is a sort of regulatory um, process that's emerging in a very, very different context. Um, it's, it's really, it's, it's good. Um, but when you compare the Fijian and Australian approaches to the UK approach, um, well, if the UK approach goes through as we imagine it is as it's drafted in this bill, you can see that the UK's approach is almost completely inverted. It's aiming to be strong on systems first. So it's aiming to be strong on this sort of systems and processes piece. And the issue of content and content moderation is sort of somewhat more open to debate, um, a bit softer, pushed down to secondary legislation in a lot of places. And again, I think this is going to create all sorts of problems. Um, but for the purposes of my talk, I just wanted to point out that this was an inverted policy path. Um, it's, it's the complete opposite to the Australian prioritisation and it stems from the different um, political priorities of the day in different countries and different times. And I'm going to stop here because I think my point was simply to highlight that from a policy perspective, we've got these two most almost completely opposite paths to online safety acts opening up. Um, and I think troubling though it might be, it's going to be really insightful and interesting just to see how these two different approaches play out over the next sort of decade or so. 
I've definitely got my own opinions about which is better and which will be more effective. Um, but I'm really, I'm, I'm more excited about hearing from the panel and the audience about, um, you know, what you might think. Thanks so much, Rhys. I have to say, really appreciated your message of inclusiveness that we can all be world leading in our own way. It's a very positive message, I feel, to be concluding the conference on. Thanks also for the really interesting and really, I think, quite fascinating in terms of how the UK is looking at its future, or potentially its future, uh, online safety legislation in terms of previous steps taken by Australia, but also Fiji, as you rightly highlighted. I think if I could maybe have just one quick follow-up question, just because you know, these are both legal frameworks that have already been enacted. How, um, how long has the Australian legal framework actually been in force? Yeah, so the, 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 the first one, which was called the Enhancing Child Online Safety Act, and then sort of, you know, just morphed as things got moved into the online safety act. That was passed in 2015, and I think it went into force in 2016. I think they had a sort of year run up. Um, the new version of the Australian um, Online Safety Act, which has the basic online safety expectations and pieces, that was passed in 2020, um, and the requirements on that are slow. So, you know, the basic online safety expectations are being realised by these codes. These codes are only being drafted and now. They're expected, these codes are expected to be passed or registered, so um, registered with the eSafety Commissioner sort of early next year, I think, is the ambition, and then they'll be live by the sort of end of next year. So we've still got a, a long path to go. Um, and indeed, I think there's still a live political question about whether these codes will be registered. Um, I mean, the drafts that the tech industry put forward were just pretty, pretty awful. Um, and I think the eSafety Commissioner is in a, in a place now where she has to be sort of looking at them and thinking, gosh, you know, do I register these or, or are these just too inadequate to realise um, public safety expectations? Um, so it's it's very much a live a live debate, um, but the answer is the sort of the broader piece, the basic online safety expectation pieces in Australia aren't aren't live and happening yet um, because there's a process to follow. Thanks so much, Reese. I think it's really fascinating to see these emerging hybrid approaches, and this came up a lot in policy discussions yesterday as well in terms of other mm. online safety provisions and. Perhaps we can explore this more between you and Luca and Johnny, particularly in terms of the BRICS countries and their approaches to self-regulation, co-regulation in the development of codes, but also I think in terms of enforcement and, and monitoring, you mentioned the e-safety commissioner with regards to the Australian regime and um, with respect to the, the, the forthcoming, uh, so we understand a uh, regime in the UK under the online safety bill, uh, quite a considerable amount of concerns have been expressed about the discretion being given to Ofcom, which would be the regulator that would issue these codes of practice and would actually provide a lot of the safeguards and details that online services are meant to adhere to in order to address these issues of fundamental rights and legal certainty that we've been discussing the past two days as well. But before I get totally distracted by that fascinating conversation with you both, I must introduce our last but not at all final speaker for today's plenary panel, Dr. Johnny Ryan. Dr. Ryan is a senior fellow at the Irish Council for Civil Liberties and a senior fellow at the Open Markets Institute. His work focuses on surveillance, data rights, competition, antitrust, and privacy. He's the author of two books and his regulatory interventions and expert commentary appear in leading media publications, including the New York Times, Le Monde, and the Financial Times. Dr. Ryan works with lawmakers on digital legislation and has testified at the US Senate and EU institutions. He is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, a member of the World Economic Forum's Expert Network on Media, Entertainment and Information, and a member of the EPIC Advisory Board. His previous roles include Chief Police Officer at the Privacy Preserving Search Engine Brave and Chief Innovation Officer at the Irish Times. He was also an O'Reilly Foundation PhD Scholar at the University of Cambridge. Johnny, the floor is yours, and I understand you are going to be speaking to us about the developments within EU legislation and content moderation. Yes, uh, thanks, Nora. I, 
I wish I was the chief belief, uh, police officer at Brave, but I think that was a typo. But it sounds like an incredible job title for whoever gets it. Let me start off with a caveat about the prediction that I'm about to give you. Um, 10 years ago, I tried to chart the history of the internet and the history of social media and take a stab at where it might all end up. And at the same time, I was doing a project for the European Commission, which at that point was obsessed with what they call bomb making manuals. That's a piece of jargon you don't hear much about anymore. All of my predictions in that book were wrong. <laughs> so um, I want to start off by caveating the prediction I'm about to make. This prediction may very well be as wrong as my previous predictions. Uh, with that said, <laughs> here is a prediction. Um, uh, the European Union um, sometimes refers to itself less so these days than recently. It sometimes refers to itself as a regulatory superpower, as power declines in real terms, a kind of a soft power uh, emerges. For any classic uh, classicists in the audience, it's the model of the Greeks and the Romans. The Romans have the power, but the Greeks teach the Romans how to use their power and so on. <clears throat> we may be coming to the end of that. Um, hopefully not, but we may be coming to the end of that. Um, the primary thing that I was asked to speak about um, by Nora, and thank you for the invitation, it was the Digital Services Act. And I think that the Digital Services Act was probably a complete waste of time, along with maybe the Digital Markets Act as well, um, and along with the last several generations of EU digital law. It's all, it's all just nowhere. But let me back that up. And <laughs> that's not a prediction. I think that's, that's quite clearly factual. But hopefully it'll change for the better. I suspect that the Digital Services Act is generally irrelevant to the real problem that we face, generally, but not entirely, because despite its flaws, there is a kernel of hope. Now, let me describe the problem that I think we face. Back when I looked at these issues of online dangers a decade, decade and a half ago, the focus there was in the niches that a few rogue extremists might get radicalized or that particular individuals might get victimized but it was it was awful but it was niche whereas now when we think about online harm we think about the collapse of media the monetization of junk <laughs> and mass manipulation and distortion of the public information space. So the that word, Nora, that you were referring to, scale, is the theme. And it's the theme because actually the problem has got so much worse. Now, the Digital Services Act, um, I just realized I forgot to click my timer for 15 minutes, Nora. So you'll have to warn me when I'm, you know, 10 minutes over time. The, the Digital Services Act, is a strange creature because it looks like the last generation of European law in many respects. When the Commission, the European Commission, made the original proposal for the Digital Services Act, the focus, the fixation in the Digital Services Act was really on, to pick a verb, it's on publication. And that's an old verb, right? I used to work in a newspaper, the Irish Times. Let's imagine that we published something uh, very incorrect about you, Nora. Now you would phone the editor or you'd have your lawyer phone the editor and you'd say, take that down and write an apology tomorrow and make it clear to your readers that what they read about me, uh, say this tomorrow, what they read about me yesterday was not correct. So you would be notifying and taking down. It's a very familiar model. It's worked for radio, TV, print, cinema, you name it. Right? Uh, it's never worked for gossip, but it's worked for all of the other things. And originally, the Digital Services Act was basically a notice and takedown 
um, law with some bells and whistles. Now, the bells and whistles were trying to introduce transparency into big tech's big black box of data. In the Digital Services Act, we also wanted to know um, why a particular person was shown a particular thing, what they were shown. But ultimately, it was the same stuff that came out of the Christchurch call. It was a bad thing has been published and we now want to react against it as quickly as possible to try to minimize the damage. So it's a, it's a post hoc after the fact um, correction. And again, that's the approach we've had for the previous and current generations of media. And tied to it is this idea of moderation, right? of uh, sifting things, of editing them, of finding the things that have been posted and making sure that quickly we can react against them and remove them because they shouldn't have been posted. I think that whole spread of approaches is a complete waste of time when we get to large scale information. It's unfortunate, but I think it is. And once we confront that, if, if I'm right, then we free up an awful lot of resources and airtime. You'll notice that uh, Zuckerberg likes to talk about moderation. Now, most people who like to talk about moderation don't like the way Zuckerberg talks about it. He says there will be AI systems that do it, but he's still talking about moderation. Instead of talking about moderation, I think we have to face the reality, and it's, it's hard for us to face the reality, that, that when we publish something online on a social platform, a YouTube video, anything like that, it doesn't matter that we published it. <laughs> Nobody notices that we published the thing. It may as well have been one more drop in, in an avalanche of water. And that is because so many other things are published at the same time that the individual act of publication is irrelevant. It doesn't matter if the thing is still live and accessible for the broad scale of the problem, because no one's ever going to know about the thing. There's so much being published, it's, it's all invisible. It may as well have been taken down. Unless, and here's the verb that matters, unless the company involved has a system that automatically finds things that it thinks will be engaging the people, takes them out of the deluge and injects them into everyone's news feed or other feed. So the verb that matters, I think, is not publication. That's irrelevant in these contexts because of the quantity of other information also being published. The verb that matters is amplification. And we don't tend to deal with amplification. When we think of content moderation, maybe it creeps in, but it's an afterthought, I think. I'd be very happy to be corrected on that. In the Digital Services Act, amplification came in as a, literally as an afterthought, and it took quite a bit of work to get it bumped up the order of priorities. And amplification happens because the company doing the amplification can commercialize what has been amplified. So like a news editor who knows if it bleeds, it leads. You're finding the juiciest things and you're throwing them out like chum to all the world of sharks. Now, here's the issue. In the Digital Services Act, which was initially fixated on publication and then also ways to understand what was shown to who and how to identify what ought to be taken down, Eventually, the, the final text of the Digital Services Act, which now is uh, applicable as of this week, I think, um, it now has in Article 38, and this is backed up by Recital uh, 94, it now has a requirement for the relevant companies to provide an option for um, uh, recommender systems, for what will appear in their feeds, that is not based on a profile. And the definition of profile comes from the GDPR. So it's a profile about what makes you tick, basically. So now they have to give everyone, at least in the EEA, European Economic Area, the option to switch off profile-based, which I think you could say is personalized, recommender systems. 
And that is the first opportunity we have had to work our way out of this mess. And it's got nothing to do with notice and takedown or moderation or anything else. At least I don't think it has. So the big challenge for us then is, how will this choice be presented to people? And how will that be enforced on the tech firms? Let me take a break here to ask Nora how much time I have. <laughs> Three minutes, Jenny. Okay. So the enforcement problem is wrought. What is unlawful under the DSA seems to me to be largely unlawful under the GDPR anyway. And the same goes for the Digital Markets Act in, in many of the key components. So we have a new generation of European, let's call it digital law, to big acts, big regulations. And in my mind, they duplicate a lot of the work of the previous shiny bauble, the GDPR. A lot of the work for the very large online platforms, terrible acronym, VLOPS, for the, for the VLOPS, a lot of that work for enforcement will fall on the European Commission. Now, this is the same European Commission, and I, I hope, I hope this changes, but so far, it's the same European Commission that hasn't been monitoring whether the member states apply the GDPR. So same kind of rules, pretty much, um, in their consequence, if not in their drafting. And ultimately, the same structure is involved. The question is, will they be more aggressive about enforcement than they have been with the GDPR? Now, there's a broader question, and I'll just tease out the, the broader picture. In data protection law, the GDPR, that is an area where you could have already cut down on profiling and cut down on recommender systems. But you could also have addressed the decline of online media, the, the data free-for-all in advertising between thousands of companies that is a cancer on media, and what we call audience arbitrage, where the worthy publisher's audience is basically stolen with their own connivance and now available for monetization on dross, on junk content on the internet. So we could have had action on that. We're not seeing action on it. Then we've got the DMA, which introduces yet again rules on the internal data free-for-all within the, the, the small number of big tech firms. And then we've got the DSA again on algorithms and recommender systems. So let me conclude with this point. This isn't a prediction, it's two possibilities. <clears throat> There's a risk for the firms involved that the GDPR, the DSA, and the DMA are enforced. Now that is highly hypothetical, <laughs> highly. And we'll be working to try and, and see that it does happen. If they are enforced, they're a pincer movement and those companies are really in trouble. And Europe might be able to claim to be a regulatory superpower. If they're not enforced, then we run into a big problem, which is that the body that claims, the, the entity that claims, it's the regulatory superpower looking out forward, the Greeks teaching the Romans and so on, that that promise has completely failed. I've said this before, but it always strikes me. If this commission anticipates that the next commission will treat its agenda on the DSA and the DMA the way this commission treated the last commission's agenda in the GDPR, there's no point in having a commission. There's no point in having any European law. So we're, we're back to where we were 10 years ago. Is Europe serious about enforcement? We don't know. Thanks so much, Johnny. So I think it's fair to say that you've given us a very impressive overview and might I say highly critical examination of the relevant EU legal frameworks in this area. The Digital Services Act, which was enacted this week, comes into force next year. And also you mentioned relevant provisions of the Digital Mark Marketing Access, Markets Acts as well. And of course, 
as you rightly mentioned, these are all underpinned by other relevant EU legal instruments, one of which many are very familiar with. They deal with data or digital rights policy, which of course is the GDPR, which has had significant influence in many jurisdictions all over the world in terms of its approaches and its structures. But of course, one of those key elements, and you rightly highlight this in your intervention as well, is the fact that the key element here is meant to be independent enforcement of all the various different ex ante and ex post safeguards and provisions and measures and the self-regulating codes and practices. So I think given my position as chair, which I'm of course fully going to take advantage of with this fantastic expert panel before me, I'd like to put a question to everyone on the panel, which is to ask them, what is it to be a regulatory superpower in the space of online moderation without an effective enforcement system behind it. So perhaps we can move backwards, which means we begin with you, Luca, and then Reese, and then Johnny. So Luca, your thoughts. Oh, Luca, you're on mute. Again, again. At least you <laughs> worked for me, but I was yeah. just double checking, okay. Uh, I wanted to create some suspense <laughs> for <Yeah>. the audience. <laughs> Very good. What a save. Uh, what a yes. save. You should so work at Twitter. The, yes, I'm going to use that yes. one again. Uh, yes. <laughs> to be fired immediately by the new overlord. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the, the actually, this is a very good question. And uh, I remember uh, the first time I met Johnny in a train after CPDP, uh, we had a very similar conversation about the uselessness of having of having very refined uh, regulation if the enforcement is deficient. And uh, I, I tend to concur very much with uh, what actually Johnny was mentioning precisely because I think uh, that it is useless to have uh, very nice laws and authorities if then the law is not uh, well implemented by uh, the authority and the great the, the population at large uh, or businesses institutions that have to implement the law don't even know the law exists and this is very evident with regard to data protection in Brazil where there is a law that is very similar to the GDPR an authority that in in practice in theory should be uh, uh, engaging in oversight and regulation, but in practice, that is not what happens. And that is what is what is the problem with this? Having a, a, a system in theory is fine. You may even receive adequacy from the European Commission because you have a very nice law and a very nice authority. But in practice, yeah, does not regulate. It that it creates a very negative incentive. Does not achieve the regulatory. Uh, goal of regulating indeed uh, but uh, if you are in good faith you don't know how to comply with the law because the regulator does not give you uh, interesting uh, guidance or well, useful guidance on how to implement a very complicated law like the digital services act or the gdpr the, i mean we are speaking about regulation that is highly complicated and that applies to an enormous number of entities and if you do not match these with very detailed and comprehensible uh, guidelines, it's useless to have it. Uh, and if you are in good faith, you don't know how you want to comply, but you don't know. If you're in bad faith, you know that there, in any way, <laughs> no one is complying and it isn't possible to implement. So, I mean, who cares about law, right? And uh, which is what happens. Uh, and that is why also I'm very interested in uh, analyzing uh, other approaches that may become leading regulatory approaches uh, besides the usual source of wisdom, which is Europe and the US. There are a lot of interesting approaches in, in the study we do analyzing BRICS countries, for instance, coming from India or China. What I really enjoy about the Chinese approach is that they, not, they are very pragmatic. Uh, we have we have an, an upcoming publication on how they regulate data, and uh, it is very interesting the fact that they don't have only they, they know that the, the large population does not know that the law exists, and the developers do not know that the law exists. So if you want to achieve the regulatory purpose, you cannot only bet on the uh, existence of law and authority. 
because that is not a safe bet. It will not, it's not a pragmatic thinking. You have to match the law with one, inve strong investments in the kind of, of technology you want that will bake your normative values into the technology. And so you have to pour billions into technology, not think that the market will automatically adapt. And then you have to create technical standards that translate the normative values into technical commands for the developer. Otherwise, the developer will not will ever understand how to implement the law. I do not know a single developer that has a PhD in law uh, and that knows how to implement GDPR or the Digital Services Act uh, autonomously. And so either, again, the, the, the huge problem that uh, a regulation also creates is not only in terms, as you may, may, we were mentioning, Nora, in terms of fundamental rights, uh, privacy, security, uh, free speech is also terms in terms of uh, eliminate creating an enormous barrier for businesses. If you have very complicated regulation that only Facebook and Google can implement, hiring hundreds of lawyers that explain to developers how to implement it or how to pretend they are implementing, you will only have Facebook and Googles in the market. And all the startups will not be able to compete because they don't know how to implement. They, know, they risk to be sanctioned. And so either they don't implement the law and they will be sanctioned, or they simply decide to get into another business to avoid being sanctioned. So this is a very uh, 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 pressing need also to understand that we have to regulate in a different way. Sorry if I was speaking too much. Thank you so much, Luca. Not at all. I really appreciated your enthusiasm. And I must say, I agree with all of your points and most, if not all, of the concerns that you raised. I I, I don't want to break the flow because I really do want to give uh, Reese and Johnny their opportunity to address this question as well. But I hope you don't mind me raising or pointing out when it comes to the BRICS context as well, that, that elephant in the room with respect to fundamental rights approaches to digital governance and regulation and, and China, because there are a lot of very interesting discussions coming out regarding the alternative approaches that China as a very different legal system is pursuing in terms of online moderation, but also censorship. But in terms of there being for one to putting it in another way, and I'm sure you have a much more appropriate term for this, Luca, in terms of the BRICS effect, it would be fascinating to see, you know, how different elements from these different jurisdictions and the alternative approach and safeguards and regimes that they're developing right now could provide an alternative to the currently influential but arguably struggling legal systems that Johnny was discussing earlier on. But without pushing all the pressure on, on the BRICS systems, perhaps Australia has, has answers for us, having already gone down the road of online moderation regulation. Reese, what can you share with us? If, if Luca was optimistic, um, perhaps you know, I'm going to cancel that out right now. I'm so sorry. I think. Oh that my goodness. Enforcement, <laughs> enforcement is just a, a globally lacking issue. I think, and and I, I think I'm definitely more cynical than Luca here. I, I'm not 100 percent convinced that a problem, the problem, or even part of the problem um, is a lack of fundamental understanding or guidance or anything. I think mm -hmm. there's there's some sort of broader issues at play from I don't know there seems to be a revolving door um, between regulation and big tech um, revolving door of stuff that I'm not 100% sure always works in the best interest in the public best interests anyhow um, and, and I'm also not 100% convinced that at least many of the large players in this space um, act in good faith when it comes to implementing and acting around regulation. And I think that the, the experience that Australia had and that Canada may be just about to have in negotiating their news media bargaining code um, and Facebook's behaviour in absolutely catastrophically shutting off the broadest range of services in the middle of an active bushfire season during a pandemic rollout um, does not suggest that these are, these are industries that just struggle to understand what the law means. These are industries that actively attempt to um, act outside the spirit of the law in as many ways. Um, so I think these are really profound questions and they're very big um, and, and deep and consequential. 
I'm not 100% sure that Australia's got any answer to, to give you there. And we've been trying it for, what, what's it now, seven, eight years. Um, you know, I think we need a fundamental, I, I think Johnny's right, there's been a lot of focus on getting the right laws in place and not enough on implementation. But maybe my optimistic piece is, maybe this is a timeline piece. Maybe we had to get the right laws in place before we could sort of start regulating on them. I'm not 100% sure I'm convinced by that, but I just didn't want to end on a, a deeply cynical, um, you know, we're all doomed note. Well, thank you very much for that, Reese. I completely concur with your final point, which I think is a hugely important one, particularly when it comes to laws and governance in any digital spaces, which is the, um, from my knowledge, certainly as a, a lawyer in Europe and having done some work on this in South Africa, the incredible striking lack of a culture of post-legislative scrutiny and evaluation on the actual impact and effectiveness of laws. I will say this, certainly for EU pieces of legislation, a culture has emerged, particularly since the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights became law, that you have provisions in relevant legislation that does refer to this evaluation, but whether or not it's being meaning meaningfully done or whether enough time has passed yet, just like recent amendments to the Australian Online Safety Act, which just became law this year, time must pass before we can assess them or well, we're all part of this living legislative experiment that you mentioned. To try and keep that more positive, constructive note going, Johnny. That sounds a bit artificial. What what would you finish say, a sentence, Nora? <laughs> what would you say, Johnny, to the possible const more constructive solutions to enforcement? If you could rewrite the Digital Safety Act tomorrow, would there be some key provisions that you would have included? Particularly, I think, to address the very significant and important issue of amplification and the system-based issue of the algorithmic systems that these companies choose to run in terms yeah. of the data sharing on their well, systems. Uh, Nora, what I was lobbying for was that those systems would be off by default. And then you can start to design what it looks like when the person is asked, do they want them switched on? If you're going to rate dangerous technologies, I don't think the list has to be that long before algorithmic content recommender systems feature on that list. Along with all of the other dangerous technologies in the world, I think it's 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 up there. Um, let me go back to, uh, now, the legislators said no, but we'll, we'll allow people to switch them off. Let me go back to um, uh, Luca's point about Brazil and adequacy. Whatever about Brazil's adequacy, and this is a reference to a type of agreement that the European Commission makes with a non-European country so that there's a free flow of personal data. Very, very useful for business, for example. Whatever about Brazil's adequacy, uh, it's been clear to me from the start that the UK should not have received adequacy. I mean, certainly not. It's one thing for our enforcers inside the European Union and economic area to be completely ineffective. Okay. That's an internal problem, but it's unacceptable <laughs> to smile upon an external country's enforcer being at least as ineffective as our own. And that the commission did not take the opportunity to force the ICO to up its game. To me, it showed a lack of interest in improving the situation. And on the revolving door that Rhys is referring to, from the ICO, we've seen leadership, very senior leadership, leave and go immediately, immediately, the next day, I think, to Meta's primary law firm in one case. And another very senior person went to an ad tech advertising technology slash profiling company, which is currently under investigation. Uh, now, and, and that person had been running a supposed investigation into ad tech, which of course produced nothing after years. So there's a problem and it's not just within Europe. And there's a problem in Europe's appetite to capitalize on that problem, to, to push for, for improvement. 
On this question, I, I agree with Rhys of whether companies can comply. I've been a data protection officer in a tech firm. It wasn't a huge tech firm, but last time I checked, they had 50 or 60 million users a month, uniques. Most of the so-called privacy pro stuff, this is what privacy professionals call themselves. It is true, it's a bit of a charade um, because they have been operating for you know, two decades in a regulatory environment where you needed to tick the boxes and the enforcer had no teeth of any consequence. So of course, a culture of box tickery that is disconnected from the reality evolved. But I can tell you, in the company I worked for, I don't think we were breaking the law at all. Now, that's difficult to do, but um, there, you can comply. There are things you have to do, and uh, you have to bake it in at a very low level in the company and build it up from there. But it is doable, and everyone should do it. However, the question is, where should the burden fall? Back under the old data protection directive, I know that the Irish enforcer used to be fond of going after individual uh, private investigators <laughs> or you know, a small dentist whose files weren't in order. They wouldn't take on a big player. This is now a long time ago. They would go after the small player. That is clearly for the birds. That's an expression that means nonsense. And although there isn't a risk-based approach built into the GDPR, I think it is implicit, it's assumed, that you need to go after the players that are causing the most harm. So clearly, the burden of enforcement should primarily fall on the people who cause the most risk. And let me just, just um, uh, get into the, the first question you asked, Nora, and then I'll shut up. It was about enforcement. Yes, the enforcers are not playing ball with each other. Most of them are quite ineffective. Not all, but most. The beauty in the GDPR is that the individual, and in some cases, NGOs representing individuals, have the right to go to a judge. You have a right to a judicial remedy. But the problem is that that judicial remedy is limited to the rights you have under the GDPR. Those are in chapter three. There's a whole lot of things you would want to go to a court about, which are in chapter four. And that is entirely the preserve of the supervisory authorities, and they don't seem to have the appetite to really pursue that in any detail. So I think what we need to see is that the right of action is wider than it has been currently framed. Yes, it has very sadly come to that time to conclude both this panel and the conference at the end of the day. It's been a really fantastic two days and we've had some fantastic presentations and discussions covering all aspects and elements of online safety from content moderation to anonymity online, digital rights, how activities and rights as they apply in the real world or the physical world perhaps is the better way to describe it, don't necessarily translate then into the digital online space. And we had a really interesting presentation yesterday on the right to protest in the real world versus the right to protest online, which was an option being put forward to people during the pandemic in which a lot of people questioned as not really equating to the same freedom or the same exercise of their right to freedom of expression. We also talked as well about the importance of technical standards and how they get aligned with legal safeguards in this area, like the importance of encryption and data security and cybersecurity in general, with regard to not just the protection of people's reputations and cyberbullying, and also other safeguards in terms of due process and voting systems and journalism, but how those technical safeguards, how we approach them and how we embed them into legal safeguards, such as data security and the importance of encryption and end-to-end -end encryption. But finally, I'd just like to note that large scale events like this annual conference, they don't just simply happen. You need a whole teams of people from all over. And I just want to take a moment to thank some particular colleagues who've helped with organizing this event over the past few months and weeks and especially the last few days when these things get wrapped up to Eliza and Shrudika and Maureen and our head of events Chetna 
And I'd like to give a really special thanks to all of our speakers, our final plenary panel, our discussants, all of our chairs, and also huge thanks to Professor Sonia Livingston, who gave a really fantastic keynote lecture yesterday on children's rights in the digital environment. And there's actually a really nice book ending here between that and this panel, because she focused a lot on the challenges of implementation of General Comment 25 of the UN Rights of Convention, of the UN Rights of the Child Convention. So with that, I'd like to thank our plenary panel again for a really provocative, insightful and very rich conclusion to the event, giving all of these fantastic comparative insights, recommendations. I think quite a number of concerns were raised, but there is no harm, if I can use that term, in dealing and expressing these concerns, because only then can we properly address them going forward. So thanks so much to you all.